here it comes, Joe. This is Dr. Joseph Elkinton, who is a professor of entomology with the Department of Environmental Conservation at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And he will be giving us a presentation about uh, some really good updates, I think, with regard to emerald ash borer biological control. So, Joe, uh, thank you so much for being here, and take it away. Okay, are we are we all set in terms of sound, and and uh, you see the see the screen and everything? Yes, you sound great, and we see your slide. Okay, great. Well, uh, it's it's a pleasure to be here to, today and to present this information. Um, some of you have heard uh, me talk about the Winter Moth Project, which was a big biocontrol success. So now I'm switching gears and talking about the Emerald Ash Borer Program. For the Winter Moth System, I will, I will, my, only my lab pulled that off, but this is a huge national effort. All these people listed on this screen are involved in leading parts of this project. Uh, indeed, most of the slides I'm showing come from them. Uh, I, I lead the UMass uh, part of the project, um, but that was started by my former uh, colleague Roy Van Driesch, who's still active but are retired, and and so uh, this is an, an an effort of national proportions, and the insect itself is a huge threat to our ash trees. So many of you are probably familiar with this insect. It is killing ash trees all over the state of Massachusetts now. It's a fairly recent arrival. Um, um, the larvae shown here. Uh, bore in the phloem tissue beneath the bark, and they essentially girdle the tree, and they make this characteristic uh, wavy gallery. So if you see that, if you see an ash tree that looks sick and you see those galleries, that's undoubtedly what it is. Here's some more photos of the same thing. And the, the, then the, large, the adults, when they mature, make these little D-shaped holes on, on the, uh, the bark. Another sign of uh, emerald ash borer activity on a tree is all the woodpecker activities because the woodpeckers love these larvae and they 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 go after the uh the, the the larvae beneath the bark and make noticeable damage on the bark of the tree so the life cycle um the adults have feed and they mate and they lay eggs they're doing this in mid-summer and then um the larvae start to develop um, they overwinter as larvae and pupate beneath the bark, and then they come out the following spring. So, um, emerald ash borer was first showed up in in um, Michigan in 2002, um, and it comes here from China. So it is well known all across uh, the Far East. Um, our populations originated in China, and so time for poll question number one. Great, thank you, Joe. And again, another reminder to those of you looking for continuing education credits and everyone listening today, please respond to this poll question. question will close in 10 seconds. All is closed and the results are 85% saying false, 15% saying true. A majority have it. Joe? Try it. Are we all set? Yeah. Good to go. Okay. Well, um, these beetles came from China via um, uh, the the wooden frame beneath the, the uh, wooden frame beneath all of these uh, uh, material we get from from China, the wooden pallets, uh, and uh, so the USDA has worked with the, the Chinese authorities to try and make sure that. Uh, 
the any wooden pallets are uh, made with wood that has been incubated or, or heat treated for a significant time that will kill the insect how well that is working i don't i couldn't tell you but you can there's definitely that's how the, the you've got obviously we get wooden pallets by the millions and millions maybe the billions uh, with all the trade that's going on coming in from the container ships so anyway so so this shows, as I said, the the the, the insect was first discovered in Detroit, and you can. So this shows the spread of the infestation uh, as of about 10 years ago in 2011. So this insect has spread extremely rapidly, probably more rapidly than any other invasive forest insect uh, that I can think of, including an Asian longhorn beetle, certainly much more rapidly than gypsy moth. Uh, so. It just exploded across the eastern United States. Um, so, time for poll question number two. Question number two is up. All question will close in five in ten seconds. All closed. As the results. 89% false, 11% true. Again, the majority have it. Yo. Okay. All right. Well, you saw the previous slide uh, from 10 years ago, and that's what this is what it looks like today. And basically, it has spread everywhere across the eastern United States, including out of Colorado and various places where it attacked, you know, urban street trees. Uh, so it is everywhere, including Massachusetts. So if you look at the Massachusetts history, it was first discovered here in 2012 out in mostly Western Massachusetts, uh, but and every year is spread uh, wider and wider. So uh, right, you know, right here in Amherst, we're losing trees right and left. So it's 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 if it's if it's not invaded your town yet, it will soon. It just shows the distribution of ash trees. So this. Insect is a specialist on ash. There's there's three species of ash: uh, white ash, black ash, and, and green ash. White ash is the most uh, dominant tree that we have, and and is especially in the forest. It is especially prevalent out in the Berkshires. But ash is a very favorite uh, street tree, so uh, it occurs in urban areas and suburban areas all over, everywhere. So the damage. Uh, um, as I said before, they uh, feed in the phloem tissue. The, this is the the uh, the living tissue beneath the bark that conducts the 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 sugars from the tree canopy to the roots. That's where the uh, uh, you know the, the maple sugar comes through this area. Um, so it simply girdles the tree and leads to a lot of tree death. So the, you know we've had massive die-offs all over. Uh, the country of ash trees in our forests. So ash is very prevalent along our river, rivers as well as the riparian species. So the green uh, uh, map shows where, how widespread ash is. There is ash on the west coast as well, different species. Uh, so it's, it's a threat nationwide, uh, killing lots of trees. Urban trees, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the, the uh, Slide on the last show, on the left shows the the urban trees and the the, <laughs> the slide on the right shows after the trees have been removed because they all died. 
Okay, well, what, what are our uh, options for, for dealing with this insect? Uh, we can, and mechanical control is infeasible. Chemical control is certainly used on, on uh, in urban areas and in suburban areas, many people protect their their trees with with tree and and, and uh, with injecting uh, systemic pesticides. There's some uh, um, handbooks that you can paint to just describe the materials that uh, you can use. Amomectin benzoate, for example, uh, uh, that's not my specialty, nor uh, so uh, nor the focus of this talk. But it is certainly widely used. But of course, it is very expensive. So it is certainly infeasible in a forest situation. There is work going on to try and breed uh, res resistant ash trees. Some of the Asian ash trees, Manchurian ash is resistant to this species. Uh, but like all tree breeding programs, that takes decades to, to pull off. So it's, it's not, not gonna be something we can use anytime soon. So classical biocontrol is, is which involves introducing natural enemies to attack into the species uh, is the way to go and that's but so uh, for many uh, years, there was a survey effort, uh, you know, and you, you may remember these purple uh, purple EAB traps uh, baited with manuka oil. Uh, I think that effort is mostly over with because uh, it was useful when we, when emerald ash borer first invaded, but uh, emerald ash borer is everywhere now, so there's no point in surveying for it. As I said, there, there are various chemical uh, um, Pesticides that you can use, uh, which uh, provide uh, um, pump protection uh, up to two years, uh, so protection. And so uh, uh, you can. Um, there's an, here's an um, uh, a little book written by Daniel Her Dan Herms and Deb McCullough, etc., uh, who uh, provide uh, guidance as to insecticide options in, for dealing with this insect in a shade tree environment. But as I said before, that's not feasible in the forest situation. So there's a whole group of people, uh, and I'm part of a large team uh, that has been working on uh, biocontrol of the system. I kind of joined it late after my my colleague Roy Van Drish, who started it off with Jian Duan, uh, retired. So I now lead the Emerald Ash for the, the biocontrol program at UMass, but I'm a late comer to this project. Our leader, um, is Jian Duan, and I'll show you a picture of him in a minute. So what is classical bi biocontrol? Um, it's, um, it's a, it involves introducing native natural enemies, and the, by and far and away the most, uh, I don't think there's any work that I know of going on, on in terms of pathogen introductions, uh, but the vast majority of biocontrol efforts involve these parasitoids, and that's true of, of many biocontrol grabs, including the one I, I did on winter moth, which I've described in previous talks. Um, and it's great, but if you can get them established, um, uh, first of all, you have to prove they don't attack other species that we, that native species that we don't, we want to protect. But if, if you if they get the, that, that past that hurdle and you can get them established, the, the, the beauty of the biocontrol is that it takes off on its own and can convert an insect to a non-pest. Uh, uh, that is on a permanent basis. So, um, so when is it used? Well, as it's when this when the invasive species is not native and is causing economic uh, damage and control. I'm sorry, you can't read this. Those the, 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 the underneath there. It means that uh, you know other means are not are not feasible. So biocontrol has been used for for more than a hundred years on many on many um, um, tree trees and various things across across the world, and there have been many famous e examples of success. Uh, I uh, had a big success with this uh, this approach on the winter moth. I've, I've given that talk before. Some of you may have seen that. Winter moth is an invasive inchworm that came from Europe and was sh has shown, the distribution is shown in red from Long Island up, up along the coast of Maine. And um, back in 2004, it invaded Eastern Massachusetts and spread like wildfire. This is defoliation from winter moth. It was a major defoliator. And uh, and um, it just, uh, so it spread all across Eastern Massachusetts, but we got the fly established. So it went from a major defoliator. Uh, it took us uh, 15 years. We started our project in 2005. Uh, it took, you know, it, we got 
the big real big success more than a, uh, a decade later in 2016 and so um, we now have converted windmall to a non-pest so in terms of the emerald ash program the leader of our effort is Gian Duan shown here and he was a UMass grad I, I he was in some of my classes way back uh, and uh, the beauty of Gian is that he is a, a, a Chinese national he grew up in China He's fluent in Mandarin and Chinese culture, so he's the perfect person to go to China and, uh, and, the, and, and the Far East to, to look for parasites because he knows how to get around over there and, and do what you have to do to interact with all the, the Chinese uh, officials and, and, and Chinese scientists uh, to help this project succeed. So he played a critical role. Julie Gould is another uh, another UMass grad who was my former PhD student who worked on winter moth, I worked on gypsy moth, but she now leads the uh, the uh, EAB project on Cape Cod. So they do a huge amount of rearing of, and, and host range testing. So she has given this seminar before. Um, anyway, and indeed many of the slides I'm showing you come from her. All right, so here's again when, when we use class, uh, biocontrol. And so uh, the the biocontrol project depends on rearing the parasitoids in the laboratory and just doing host range testing against other other species. It takes decades to pull this off because because all those experiments that you have to do before you even get permission to release it um, take many years to pull off. And then when the parasitoids are 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 reared, they're released into the field in a variety of methods shown here. These little cages. Where the parasites, the, how many of the parasites are, are produced in the Brighton lab in Michigan, the USDA lab in Michigan, and so for each of the different parasites, there are different uh, release methods, and they, these parasites have been released at um, uh, 25 different states, uh, so um, uh, and successfully recovered in many places, including here in Massachusetts. So. Then once you release the, the parasitoids, then you go back and uh, um, do sampling to see if the parasitoids are established. And that involves peeling the bark and collecting the larvae and bringing the larvae back and, or bring or, or, and rearing them out to see if the larvae have the parasitoids inside them. And you can also sample these parasitoids simply by putting out uh, these little yellow pan traps and you they collect the parasitoids adult in that way. So it's in, once you do the release, then the next step is, is to go back later, a year or so later, and find out whether you actually got the parasitoid established. So uh, Julie has led a big program in, uh, doing, in urban forests in Colorado and various places uh, where um, ash is used as a street tree, and she has uh, uh, is combined with pesticides um, to try and uh, bring these these uh, uh, infestations in urban street trees under control. And so this shows the release of the parasitoid test Tritasticus, which has been successfully established in many parts. I believe this this slide is from from Colorado. Okay, so. The goal of the popular of a, a biocontrol project is to bring what we call R sub zero, which is the reproductive rate, the generational reproductive rate of the emerald ash borer down to a low level of, of, of below than one. When R sub zero equals one, that means the, the, the population is no longer growing. You, in fact, you may have heard this, this same terminology used for COVID. In COVID infestations, uh, the, the goal of the, um, you know the the protection, the masking, and all of the the, the, the you know the sh school shutdowns and everything is to reduce the R sub zero for COVID to to one, which means it's no longer expanding exponentially in the population. All populations, whether you're talking about COVID or talking about emerald ash borer, have the have the ability to expand um, exponentially if they are not under control. So the whole idea of biocontrol was to bring that R sub zero down to one where the population will then remain stable and at a density where they're no longer killing ash trees. So that's our goal. Okay, well, here's the, the various parasitoids um, that were introduced from China, um, opi Opius agrilli, the egg parasitoids, Spatheus uh, and Testrasticus are larval parasitoids. They, 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 you know, the ovipositors, these, 
these parasitoids drill right through the bark. They have an amazing ability to detect larvae beneath the bark, and they they drill through the that's the, you know that you know ovipositors are if you've been stung by a honeybee that's that's an ovipositor, a modified ovipositor. These these insects have an amazing ability to parasitize larvae below the bark. So oobius with an egg parasitoid, uh, the female lays the egg. The eggs are, are are laid on the surface of the bark in a little uh, um, um, indentation, and uh, the, the 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 little egg parasitoid, tiny little thing, uh, um, blows up inside the egg. Uh, Tetrascus is another parasitoid. It's a it's a it attacks the larval stage, showing you know drilling through the bark shown here. The the parasitoid larvae develop inside the the emerald ash borer larvae, and then the parasitoid uh, pupate outside the larvae under the tree bark, and then the adult parasitoids chew little round holes uh, to emerge from the tree trunk. So that that parasitoid has been widely established and is having a significant effect. And then uh, species of grilli is uh, another parasitoid. Uh, that hasn't uh, succeeded so well in the northern areas, um, and so then um, in terms of mass rearing of the, the EAB um, to um, produce these parasitoids, and is done in, in the uh, in the laboratory with various methods uh, developed mostly by Julie and her her colleague down at Otis, and also at the Brighton Lab in Michigan, and. So it's a huge undertaking to rear up both the larvae to uh, uh, produce the parasitoids, uh, as well as to determine whether the larvae brought back to the field have the parasitoids inside them. Okay, so again, the native range of of, of the emerald ash borer uh, is in Asia, uh, not just not only in China but also in the Russian Far East. So some efforts have now been made to find uh, the parasitoids from the Russian Far East and the 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 most exciting new development is this Spatheus galini, which was introduced about five years ago um, from the Russian Far East. Uh, it has a, a long ovipositor. It is very species specific. And uh, so it was approved, you know, I guess maybe it was 2014, I think. Um, uh, and uh, it has a good climate match to the northern areas. To This shows that in this country, it, it comes from uh, the Vladivostok action, and it, the, the key thing is it has a, a longer overpositor than Tetrasticus, so it can attack. Tetrasticus is seemingly limited to smaller diameter trees, which have a thinner bark, whereas species Galini uh, can attack larvae and older trees, and that's critical. So, um, so will this these uh, introductions control emerald borer? Well, it's looking quite promising. Um, as I said, Tertasticus can uh, effectively protect smaller ash trees. Um, uh, so um, this, these, this is a study from Michigan showing that uh, high levels or high levels of parasitism in smaller ash trees by this parasitoid. And we have uh, established uh, uh, um, release sites at these various places. And our, our, our goal on these release sites um, uh, is to s s release the parasitoids and then go back year after year and measure the density of EAB. That's called a life table study, you know, in order to establish whether or not pa uh, parasitism is um, uh, controlling the insect. Okay, so that means involves going back to these sites and you peel the bark. And this is my the person in the red hat is my colleague Roy Van Drish, who helped start this project. At, uh, he, yeah, um, he and Dion Duan started this project way back more than 10 years ago in Michigan and subsequently Massachusetts. And I only took over this project because he retired, although he's still very much involved. Okay, so um, to, to uh, assess the impact of uh, these larval parasitoids or all these parasitoids, egg parasitoids as well, you have to uh, quantify or measure the impact of all the other sources of mortality, and woodpeckers are a huge uh, and important uh, part. Um, 
uh, of the control because the woodpeckers themselves can detect the EAB larvae beneath the bark and they cause a quite a bit of mortality, maybe 35 to 100%. So um, we go into these sites and we peel the bark and collect the larvae uh, and determine whether, the, you know, we determine whether the larvae has been parasitized. Uh, we determine whether um, some of the galleries are, are simply have no larvae in them and you can, the woodpeckers make telltale holes. And then sometimes uh, the larvae just die from unknown causes. We don't really know whether it's, is it the tree, uh, did they die because the tree resistance or is there a disease or whatever. I mean, we, and we are not working with the diseases, but, and this is not a very large source of mortality, but it's part of our life table study uh, in order to estimate the impact of these parasitoids. So, um, so this shows the impact on pole size trees uh, following uh, the releases of Tetrasticus and the, the densities of, this shows the number of EAB larvae per square meter of phloem has come way down thanks to Tetrasticus. And uh, again, uh, the Tetrasticus comes down. Um, this, I guess, is uh, working in, in, the, in the larger trees, so there's not much difference in, in mortality between the control and release sites. But in the Spaceys Galini, there's had a huge impact. Um, as I said, it has a long L depositor and it can attract larger, larger trees. So the most recent data is looking extremely promising in that, and these are in the, in the larger trees, the attack rates by Spaceys have taken off and the, the emerald ash borer densities have come down. So this is just, this is sort of hot off the press. We just published that this year. The impact of these other parasitoids is, is relatively minimal. Um, you can see the woodpeckers take out a, a good proportion of the, of, the, of the larvae, but the thing that's really different is Spathius galeni shown in green here has really taken off. So you, you have high levels of parasitism and the densities are starting to come down. So if you look at the, the so-called R sub zero, um, um, we see that the uh, the parasitism um, by this species without tetrastic, you know, we mathematically we can remove the effect of these other parasitoids, and if you remove the effect of of, of um, the other parasitoids, uh, they have had a minimal effect. But if you remove the effect of Spathius galini, it has a very big effect. And the total population is coming down. So the R sub zero is coming down toward one. And if we, we and so it looks like it, it all looks very promising. You know, it's it's just uh, you know we're, we're approaching the point where we believe we are uh, achieving stability of emerald ash borer at a lower density, at, um, which will allow the trees to survive. We the whole purpose of biocontrol is simply to reduce the density of the target insect. That's what I did with, with winter moth um, to a level which is no longer a pest. So we, we will be living with emerald ash borer in the future, but hopefully the densities won't be so high that the trees will be girdled. So you'll, um, and that's the whole goal of our project and it's looking very promising. But it's something that has taken quite a few years to get, get established. So time for poll, poll question number three. The poll question is up. So the poll question will close in 10 seconds.
fall closed the results 87 percent true 13 percent false majority got it right joe okay so i'm coming to the end of my talk i maybe this is shorter than i thought but anyway um yeah, these research sites that we have established in in, in New England, uh, there's been a significant reduction in the EAB density uh, over the experimental time period, and um, significant increases in larval parasitism, particularly by Spathius galeni. And the, so the Spathius galeni, according to our analysis, is the major cause of this population decline. So it's extremely promising. Um, uh, at these sites. We are continuing the process of releasing um, uh, species cleaning, so, uh, um, and uh, other parasitoids as well. So there's a, it's, a, it's an ongoing process, um, and it's looking uh, promising, particularly at the sites in Michigan, where we have, uh, uh, seems like uh, have largely re re reduced uh, uh, ash mortality of the younger trees and uh, there are definitely um, some, uh, signs of older trees recovering from for previous EAB uh, infestations so it's, 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 it looks promising for the future so we think we're on the verge of a, of, of a major biocontrol success with Emerald Ash Borer. Um, as I said the sites with older infestations uh, or I have tree, signs of trees recovering, uh, but nevertheless, EAB continues to spread quickly across the landscape. So, um, unfortunately, you should not expect that the, the parasites will prevent trees in your yard from becoming infested and dying because it takes time. I mean, these data we're showing you are in the sites that had, where the emerald ash borer has been there for 10 years, and many trees died. So, there's a huge catch up game. Uh, it's the same true. The same was true with winter moth. It, it takes years for the parasitoids to build up in populations um, um, to catch up with the emerald ash borer, and in the meantime, unfortunately, a lot of the trees will die. So you shouldn't expect this to be uh, save all the trees in in, in your yard or in, in you, the, the forest that you're involved with. Um, uh, but we, we we think of this more. Um, as something that will save, you know, save ash trees from, from going extinct in our forest, and will allow the persistence of ash and the eventual recovery of ash over time. And so we, we feel very good about this. It shows, uh, you know, this like with the winter moth project, this project uh, took decades of dedicated work um, uh, by mostly by my colleagues that I have mentioned, and. Uh, uh, so it feels very gratifying to be on the verge of a success. Time will tell whether the, the, the trends we are showing will actually achieve what, what we think we are seeing. So I that, that uh, is the end of my talk. Uh, maybe it ended a little sooner than what I predict, predicted, but at any rate, um, I'm going to turn my, uh, my um, video camera on, let's see, so we can open it up for questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Joe. Yes, there are plenty of questions, and since we have, we do indeed have extra time, so I very much encourage folks to continue to put questions in to your GoToWebinar control panel for Joe, and, and we'll have time to answer them. So, Joe, first question here from uh, Ned. Can you describe the, um, let's see, oh, uh, well, I'll ask this question anyways. I, I'm sorry, this is one that I had uh, I had told Ned to contact me directly, but in case you want to comment on this, can you describe the effectiveness uh, and biological impacts, especially negative, of two EAB chemical treatments uh, for keeping emerald ash borers from destroying trees? Uh, injection into the trunk uh, or the spray on the trunk and tree base? Um, Joe, if you want me to cover this one, uh, with I like I said, I, as I said in the talk, chemical uh, pesticides is not my area of specialty. I mean, I, I fully support the use in, in uh, you know, the urban areas or the, uh, protect your 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 specialty yard trees. Uh, uh, 
So I am not aware of, of the, the negative impacts, but maybe you are, Mark Tony. Sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Joe. Yes, it depends on the active ingredients being used. Of course, every chemical insecticide has sort of a risk benefit analysis that uh, you as the user um, should t take for your specific site. So like Joe mentioned, you know, just to speak a bit generally to this, um, chemical management to protect specimen trees, so trees in a landscape setting, say a really large, old, beautiful ash that is right near your house that doesn't yet show you know, say more than 30%, that rough guideline of decline in the canopy, that would be a good candidate uh, for chemical management options. And of course, as I said, each one of those uh, has different environmental risks. And I could spend probably too much time talking about that. So I'll leave it at that. And I will be in touch with Ned offline so we can ask more questions about Joe and biological control. So um, one to clarify here for Sue, Joe, where does the emerald ash borer lay their eggs? On tree trunks, the leaves, uh, where where do they lay their they eggs? On, they lay them on tree trunks, little depressions in the tree trunks. Thank you, yes. All right, let's see another one here. Uh, is China using ash trees for pallets because the emerald ash borer has killed their trees? Um, I guess, can you speak to how maybe, which trees might be selected for use for pallets? Again, I have no idea what the Chinese are doing. I, you know, there was some early uh, research uh, looking at um, uh, emerald ash borer attack on Manchurian ash versus North American ash uh, and it was it was sort of disturbing research because you know you had Manchurian ash and North American ash trees growing side by side in China and the emerald ash borer just blasted the North American ash but not the Manchurian ash so it appears that the Manchurian ash uh, has the resistance uh, to this insect um, uh, which made me wonder to think when I, when I heard those results I said oh my god this means that biocontrol uh, may not work. So it's been a pleasant surprise to me to find that it in fact it is working. Uh, so it's true that you know many when trees grow up with an insect they develop defenses. Um, I assume that there's not much in the way of North American ash trees growing in China but I have I, I would doubt that is and I have really no idea what what trees they use to make wooden pallets. But clearly they must use some because that's how the uh, the emerald ash borer got here. I would suggest just in general that trees selected for use as pallets probably aren't high quality, right? You'd save the higher quality trees for lumber, for example, but that's just my, <laughs> my guess. Uh, I, I agree with your response, Joe. And that sort of also speaks to another question from Anne. Um, you know, what does the presence of emerald ash borer look like in its native range? Does it mildly damage trees rather than kill them, or does it kill the native trees there as well? Again, I, I, as I said, I, the, the studies that I'm aware of suggest that Manchurian ash is resistant. And of course, the parasitoids are there as well. So I don't think emerald ash borer is, is, a, is a pest at all in China. And I like to if i may add that tends to be sort of the pattern we see with in the invasive insect issue right insects that evolve in their native range with the native hosts that are available you know you end up with the host um, evolving aspects of resistance against the insect and the insect you know tries to figure out how to get around those <laughs> defenses uh, to use the host um, and then you also have the parasitoids and fungi and all of the other organisms that are um, acting as natural enemies to that insect in the system so just a comment um, let's see here um, I oh. mean in their, in their native range are not necessarily non-pets uh, I mean, I I know more a whole lot more about winter moth than I do about emerald ash borer, and uh, winter moth is definitely a big problem in northern Scandinavia. They've had millions of trees killed by winter moth. Uh, so uh, some of the parasitoids that control, including the one that I introduced here, does not occur up there in northern Scandinavia. So 
gypsy moth is another example of an insect that sometimes is a big problem in its native range. Thank you, Joe. That's another great, I see I could talk too much and I don't want to take over, but that's another great point is that just because an insect is native doesn't mean that it doesn't have outbreak fluctuations in the population, which we see in our native insects all the time here. So um, very interesting stuff. Let's go to Norman's question so I don't take over. Um, uh, any type of so-called biological control is risky business. Uh, he's concerned that we're just going to have to simply allow emerald ash borer to run its course. I think maybe, Joe, could you speak to um, the differences between how biological control is done now versus historically? Yeah, well, back in the day, uh, you know, when gypsy moth first arrived, they just introduced parasitoids willy-nilly. They didn't care about non-target impact. And uh, there's some famous examples, including one I showed in my own lab, where uh, the you know, gypsy moth parasitoid Compsilora consonata has now become a huge problem on our native giant silk moths, like luna moth. And so that was an insect that we uh, should not have introduced. Uh, nowadays, there's a huge, I mean, some, Nowadays, there's a huge effort to do host range testing, which means you, if you have something you'd like to introduce, the first thing you do is a whole bunch of experiments to find out whether that parasitoid attacks native species. And, and we, we, if it does, we don't release it. We look for um, uh, parasitoids that are specialists, that, that um, attack only um, that the target invasive insect or perhaps a cub, some other closely related species. Uh, it's a trade-off, uh, but we, it's completely changed. The, paras the parasitoids I've been talking about today were all host range tested and uh, they were uh, showed that they were specialized on emerald ash borer. Thank you, Joe. Another question here from Kathy. As a homeowner, are the parasitoids that you've talked about today accessible to us as a biocontrol measure? Can they be purchased? Unfortunately, no. Um, this, it just takes, I mean, first of all, it's extremely expensive to produce these insects. Um, I mean, millions of dollars. I hate to think of how much, when the dollar cost of one thing. I mean, it's not appropriate for a homeowner to, uh, even if it, I mean, it just doesn't work that way because by the time you get the parasitoids established, uh, your ash will be long gone. As I said in my talk, it, it takes you know, decades to, for the parasitoids to build up in numbers to, to, control, to control the population. So what we're looking at is the effectiveness of, this, of, the, of these parasites in the long term on our ash forest. And millions of dollars have gone into this effort, uh, but it's worth it. It's, it's, not a, it's not appropriate for a homeowner um, to release these parasites uh, because they're, we're releasing them all over the place already. And the handful of insects that you would release would have no impact on your ash trees. Make sense? Yes, That's sounds. Bio control in general. It's all a, a national program uh, to uh, control the insects on the on the landscape scale, and they are not appropriate for homeowners. It's true of the winter moth parasitoid, for example. The experts are doing it for us, right? <laughs> um, let's see here. Um, next question. From Deborah, what will the parasitoids feed on when the level of emerald ash borer reaches the target level of one? Uh, they'll feed on emerald ash borer. The whole idea, as I tried to say in my talk, is we're definitely not eliminating emerald ash borer. It's going to be out there in significant numbers. So uh, uh, the, the parasitoids will continue to do that thing, and hopefully they'll continue to cause high levels of parasitoids. Uh, now that the populations have come down, that may be, be easier for them to to uh, maintain the, the, the emerald ash borer. They're still there. Thank you. Um, questions from Dawn. Um, are you aware of any studies about chemical treatments and whether or not they impact woodpeckers that are feeding on emerald ash borer? Perhaps could you speak more to um, sort of you know what we know about 
what percentage of emerald ash borer might be fed upon by woodpeckers? Well, as I said in my talk, the woodpeckers are causing a very high level of mortality, something like 35 percent of the larvae are. So the woodpeckers are very effective, and the biocontrol wouldn't even be feasible without them. Uh, it's a very good question about the impact of uh, pesticides on uh, on the woodpeckers. I, you know, again, I don't work on pesticides, and I don't know the answer to that question, but it's a good one. Thank you, Joe. Um, let's see, question or comment from Scott. In the start of your talk, you mentioned ways to control the spread. We manage street trees and work off the policy of 50% damage to remove the tree. In your opinion, is that percentage to be adjusted up or down to better control the spread, or is it zero tolerance? Well, um, again, I don't. I'm not involved in the process of managing <laughs> three trees, and uh, you, you know the answer to this better than I. How effective this this policy is? Um, um, the, the parasitoids are, are being released everywhere, and hopefully, eventually, they'll get established protect the trees that uh, don't get killed. But, and, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of frightening how quickly the emerald ash borer has spread across the landscape. It's, it's hard to prevent it, and I'm, uh, but I don't work in the area of controlling spread. Yeah, Scott, I, that's tough to respond to, I think, for me, without knowing the specifics of where you are. And But as Joe said, my gut instinct is emerald ash borer not only spreads very readily with accidental human-aided movement, but it's a great flyer and moves very quickly on its own. Um, if you're in Massachusetts, it's currently throughout the state. And so if you're managing street trees, I would focus on managing them for safety, um, you know, prioritize safety and sort of what you're trying to achieve with your urban forest. Um, Anne has a question, how do ash trees recover? Do they regrow in the areas damaged by the emerald ash borer? How do they recover? Well, if you can get the density of larvae down, uh, there will be dead patches in the phloem, and <laughs> presumably the tree can produce new phloem as it, from the cambium. I don't really know. I don't have an extreme amount of knowledge about how that process works, but all I know is that trees are recovering. The trees can tolerate a little bit of dead tissue in the flow and as long as the tree is not soft girdled. Thank you, Joe. Let's <laughs> see, question from Nicole. Um, given the success of the parasitoids, would you recommend starting ash replanting efforts now, even without resistant trees? Well, that's a good question. I, I don't have a good answer to that. I mean, I, uh, I'd be inclined to wait until the parasitoids are really well established all across the landscape. I mean, I know, you know, we've presented data from these sites where we have released some, you know, decades or many years ago, uh, I know I've been, I've been sampling at some other sites here in Massachusetts where the emerald ash borer has just arrived, and even though the parasites have been released, they, they, the parasitism levels are nowhere near what they need to be to, to save these trees. So I personally, I would say it's a bit early to start uh, regenerating ash trees. Of course, it'll take a few years for the, for the trees to get big enough for the, the emerald ash borer to attack them. So that's a judgment call. I, I personally would, would would hold off until the parasites are more widely established. Thank you, Joe. Um, question from Chuck, and I've heard you, I think, speak to this before, Joe. Uh, do current day, you know, plant health care or integrated pest management programs in any way inhibit biocontrol efforts to manage pests like winter moth or emerald uh, ash borer by researchers? such as yourself. So can can those sort of maybe site-specific chemical management programs coexist with the biocontrol efforts that you're doing? It's a very good question. I don't have a good answer to that. I know that Julie Gould has been focusing on that, you know, implement, integrating chemical management with the, with the, with the uh, 
the parasitoids. I mean, obviously, if you inject uh, a tree with with with, with a stemming pesticides, you may be killing some of the parasitoid larvae as well as the emerald ash borer. Um, so, I, I, unfortunately, I don't have the the answer, although the answer may exist. Uh, and Julie Gould would be a good person to ask about that. Thank you, Joe. A question here specific to Maine. Are you aware of any biocontrol release sites in Maine? And I know we have a, a person from Maine on the call now, and maybe he can <laughs> put that in the chat if you're not aware. I'm I'm pretty sure, yes, but I, I don't have the details. I mean, okay. a lot of people were, you know, we're trying to get these parasitoids released all over the place, and I'm sure Maine has been one of those places. But I don't know the detail. Thank you. Um, let's see. Oh, a uh, question from Richard. How many life cycles per year do the parasitoids have? Oh, uh, one. Okay, question from Timothy. Does Spathius galini parasitize other species in Russia and how does it overwinter there? It overwinters the pupa beneath the bark. Um, uh, whether it attacks other species, again, uh, I'm not sure the research has been done in Russia. We've done research here in the United States to see if it uh, uh, attacks other other serumbicids and other uh, um, blue-crested larvae, and it's, it has a limited host range. But uh, in terms of research in Russia, I doubt that's ever been done. It's not a pest in Russia. I mean, you know, answers to questions like this uh, take a huge amount of effort, and there's relatively few people like me actually doing this work. <laughs> me and my colleagues, I, I presented in my talk. Thank you, Joe. A question from Marcus, uh, maybe to clarify, can you speak to how you detect emerald ash borer in trees in the first place? Yeah, well, you look for evidence of uh, emergence holes, you look for evidence of dye back of the crown, and you look for evidence of, of woodpecker activity. All of those indicate uh, an emerald ash borer infestation. Those D-shaped exit holes are, are a sign of infestation. Thank you. Um, let's see. Oh, um, a question about having a large white ash tree dead for two years. Uh, can I use the firewood without concern uh, with regard to emerald ash borer, perhaps speaking to to spread? Well, um, I, I gather you're, ten, you're planning to take that firewood elsewhere. I mean, maybe you can, um, I know there are rules and regulations that govern that activity. Maybe you know about that, Tommy, but, uh, if the tree has been dead for two years, uh, then the danger of, of you know, the brood will the brood would would have come and gone within one year, but not two years. By two years, it should be safe. That's my opinion. But no doubt you have some thoughts on that, Tony. I would just say there are rules and regulations that govern the movement of firewood, and they're different state to state. Um, and there was a federal quarantine on moving um, ash, uh, but I believe that has been lifted. <laughs> so uh, you have to pay attention to the the specific requirements of each state. But if your tree, you know, is on your property, uh, you have a dead ash on your property that you want to use as firewood on your own property, your risk there is very, very minimal. But of course, sort of a best practice would be to reduce, um, you know, the, the risk of spreading potentially emerald ash borer infested ash trees uh, much further distances. Let's see. Um, questions here. There's so many. Sorry. <laughs> it's getting, uh, they're getting moved around on my control panel here. Um, oh, uh, Cody, I'll a uh, answer this one. If Joe doesn't mind, he asks, does emerald ash borer target any other tree species? And we mentioned that yesterday, um, uh, that uh, Chiononanthus virginicus or the white fringe tree is a, another tree species that emerald ash borer has been found to be able to complete its life cycle in. But 
our native Fraxinus are really the primary concern here. Joe, do you want to add anything to that? Well, that, that, that is exactly correct, Bonnie. Uh, we have three native ash trees, uh, white ash, um, black ash, and green ash. Um, they grow in different types of locations. Uh, white ash is the main tree uh, uh, for use in urban areas and the main tree in the forest, in our forest as well. Um, all of those ash trees are susceptible, but only that that fringe tree is the, is the, it's the other known host. Thank you. Another question here from Aaron. Uh, it sounds like Spathius is turning out to be the most effective parasitoid. Do you foresee abandoning rearing and release of the other two wasps, or is the mix of the three species still preferred? Uh, I think the mix is still preferred. Uh, I know, to, as I tried to say in my talk, Trasicus is actually uh, more effective and very effective in pole size trees. So uh, Spathius is, is uh, obviously the most effective in the larger trees. Uh, Obvious, the uh, results have been a little bit disappointing, the egg parasitoid, although uh, just recently my colleague Duan, uh, Gian Duan told me he has new evidence of higher levels of parasitism. So every parasitoid helps, but Spathius is the one that's really looking the best. I mean, at a certain point, there's no point in releasing the parasites because they're already there. So um, they're already established fairly widely. And if you do releases, you want to concentrate on areas where um, it's not, the parasites are not yet established. And there's plenty of areas where, you know, I, I showed that map of Massachusetts. There are some areas where the, the, the MLI-4 is only just getting established. So those would be good sites to release the parasites. Thank you. A question from Curtis. I think I spoke to this a little bit, but is emerald ash borer a strong flyer or has it has its quick spread been due to human activity? I, I think it's both, um, but it's clearly a strong flyer. I mean, I've, I, I've been amazed at how quickly uh, this insect has spread all across the landscape in just a, a couple of decades. It's all over the East United States. So, it's, you know, the natural flight uh, must be uh very spectacular compared to other species like asian longhorn beetle for example which hasn't spread as nearly as fast and of course the classic example is gypsy moth which is still spreading across the midwest 150 years after it was introduced because <laughs> the females don't fly winter moth is another example where the females don't fly thank you um Question from Stephen, do woodpeckers cause further physical harm to the ash trees similar to birds and skunks foraging for grubs and turf or does their feeding outweigh the damage they may cause? Well, as I mentioned in my talk, the woodpeckers have an amazing ability to detect uh, the emerald ash borer underneath the bark. So they wouldn't be uh, uh, pecking on trees that have no emerald ash borer. I mean, conceivably make it, I think the, the woodpecker damage would be minimal to non-existent because they're, they're, they're going after uh, larvae beneath the bark and they wouldn't be doing, doing that if the larvae weren't there. Thank you. Um, Betty, let's see, is there concern about uh, emerald ash borer populations from other areas in its native range? Um, is there research being done on what biocontrols work on them? So maybe the question is, are we worried about subspecies? Uh, my, my answer is no. <laughs> um, it's unlikely that, well, first of all, we don't think there are, we don't know of any subspecies. It's, it's widely um, dispersed across uh, China and the adjacent areas. Uh, I mean, it's possible there might be subspecies, but as far as we know, the the, the parasites will attack all of them. Uh, subspecies tend to grow uh, appear on isolated populations, which are, do not exchange genetic material with the the um, you know the main population. It's possible we don't know about that, uh, uh, and there, there's no evidence that the parasites would would care. Thank you, Joe. Another 
great question here about the interactions with emerald ash borer, the biocontrol, and woodpeckers. Do woodpeckers also eat the parasitoid infested EAB larvae? Uh, and Holly asks, is that an issue with regard to the spread of the parasitoid population? Uh, I'm trying to remember what we have some evidence on that. I'm trying to, I, I don't remember the answer. I think it, as I recall, the, the woodpeckers. By the time the parasitoids uh, um, attack the larvae, they you know they attack the larvae and they emerge to pupate under the bark. Um, they've largely destroyed the the the, the uh, what the woodpecker would like to feed on. So uh, um, I think there's little interaction between the woodpecker and the parasitoid. Now, on the other hand, if the the parasitoid is very young inside the larvae, I'm sure the woodpeckers would would prey on them, but so there will be some cross um, interaction, meaning that the woodpeckers will attack some of the parasitoid larvae. But that's and that's true in many biocontrol uh, systems. The combined activity of the woodpeckers and the parasitoids is much better, much higher than if either one is by themselves. So all the, you know, even though the woodpeckers might be feeding on some of the parasitoid larvae, they're doing a huge uh, uh, benefit to eating some, some of the larvae, even though it makes sense. Thank you. Um, Patrick asks, can you speak a bit to the processes by which other countries, you know, such as China, vet and restrict the spread of pests and diseases leaving from their country? Well, I know the USDA has passed regulations which require that um, wooden pallets be treated, uh, you know, heat treated. I showed, I showed, uh, I think a slide to that effect, and uh, or possibly. Uh, so, with proper treatment, you can kill these larvae. Whether the Chinese actually do that, I don't know. <laughs> there might be regulations in place, but what are they? Are they, are they followed? That's a, I'm sure it's an expensive process to treat the wooden pallets. I think on both ends, it's a very expensive process. I know the, the USDA and uh, I believe Customs and Border CBP Patrol <laughs> do a lot of that. Um, and, there may be some uh, permitting process. You may have to, I don't know the answer, but there may be a permitting process which would require you to sh demonstrate that your wooden powers have been treated. That's what should be. I should otherwise, be there's no incentive for them to do it. I was going to say I should know this off the top of my head from listening to uh, Kate Aikenhead, our uh, state plant health director, speak about the percentages of, you know, incoming shipments that USDA and and their partners are able to inspect, and and it's we just there's so much trade as Joe spoke to earlier, um, it's impossible to look at everything, but the effort is trying to be made, and I'm sure more funding um, <laughs> would help, uh, as that always does. Let's see here, uh, Linda asks, could she? Could you show the life cycle slide again? Maybe go back to that. Okay, let me uh, see. How do I do this? I, uh, uh, that's way back up at the beginning. So it begins with the adults feeding on the leaf tissue and then they mate and the female lays eggs. And this shows the uh, the egg cavities that are on the bark. Well, this is happening in the summer and the larvae uh, develop in the fall and they overwinter uh, beneath the bark. They pupate like all insects do. And then the adults emerge the following spring. Thank you, Joe. Um, Brian asks, can forest and landscape managers help with emerald ash borer control by cutting and burning insect infested trees? 
I, uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I don't know if it's really, uh, if it's worth the expense to do that at this point. I mean, because, I mean, biocontrol doesn't depend on that activity. It's, uh, and emerald ash borer is spreading so quickly. I'm not sure that um, a lot of effort to cut and burn infested trees is, um, is worth the effort. But uh, it, it, of course it, it could help. I mean, if you can bring cut down the trees and 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 eliminate the brood, um, that would certainly help. But I'm not sure that as a, as a policy whether the, that's an expensive undertaking. And whether I mean, since the emerald ash borer is already widespread, it, you know what, what you describe may have a, a negligible impact on further spread. Make sense? Yes. Thank you. Um... A question here from Aaron. Oh, let's see. Oh, we already we already talked about that one, so I will skip to. Um, mm. oh, oh, sorry. And then it <laughs> scrolled away. Here we go. Let's see. I think there's just a lot of interest in sort of helping to spread the parasitoids around and get them established. Um, can you speak to what are the conditions that you look for when you choose a site to distribute the parasitoids? Well, uh, we look for ash trees. For <laughs> we look for forests or stands that have ash trees and, and also ones that have uh, EAB infestations because uh, so, and we're we're working hard to produce. I mean, why we? I mean, a huge number of people uh, at, in different states, and uh, so it's a huge undertaking, a national undertaking. Which, uh, but it all depends on the parasites that are being reared. I think they're mostly reared at the Brighton lab, APHIS lab in Michigan. So it it all depends on how many they can uh, rear. It's an expensive undertaking, and so they can rear. I mean, many they've reared many, many thousands of these these insects and uh, released them all over the place. Uh, but that's that's the limitation. I don't know that you know volunteers uh, helping to spread them is uh, would be make sense because it all comes down to how many can they rear. And there we have in in every state there are uh, various officials like well not so much me but. Uh, uh, you know who are who are responsible for forest insects who were helping out to spread in the process of releasing. Thank you so much, so limited, Joe. Oh, go ahead. Number of parasitoids. Thank you. Um, let's see. We probably have one more uh, time for one more question. We have one more minute before the break. Thank you, Joe, for fielding so many questions, and thank you again all for sending so many fantastic ones in. Um, let's see here, and I'm just going back to we we've answered some of these already, and I don't want to duplicate. I want to get a new one here. Um, Oh, um, hmm. this is an interesting question from Sue. So can you tell the difference between <laughs> the exit hole from a healthy emerald ash borer leaving the tree versus, uh, I, I suppose, an emergence hole from a parasitoid wasp that has left the tree? Yeah, I believe I showed a picture of that in my slide if you go back. Uh, you. Um... The, the exit holes of, of the uh, emerald ash borer are D-shaped, whereas the exit holes of the parasitoids are round. About how big are those round exit holes from the parasitoid? It's very like size of the head of a pencil. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure I can. They, they're they're not big. They would definitely be smaller than the emerald ash borer. Sure, yes. Hard to notice, I'm sure. <laughs> All right, great. Well, thank you so much, Joe. We really uh, appreciate your time and you sharing your expertise and information with us. And, and again, thank you for fielding so many great questions from the audience.
Yeah, well, I entomology laboratory with Washington State's Department of Agriculture. He is joining us today from Washington and will be talking about murdering the hornets, an overview of eradication actions in Washington State to prevent the establishment of Vespa mandarinia. And thank you, Chris, so much. This is a topic we thankfully don't know much about here in Massachusetts, so <laughs> we're very interested to hear what you have to say. Oh, excellent. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, the general gist of this topic is I'm going to introduce some basics about the lifestyle, the biology of this organism, and then tell you what we've been doing to prevent it from establishing. So kind of a straightforward walk through the Vespa mandarinia problem. Um, the animal we're talking about, Vespa, Man Vespa mandarinia smith, is generally considered the largest species of true hornet in the world. Um, it shares that des uh, that designation with with a sister species that is almost identical ecologically, uh, and it's one of those kinds of insects that is so big, um, so easily recognized, and has so many behaviors that that impact humans that it has a, a common name in basically every place it occurs. Um, <clears throat> you've probably seen names like murder hornet or yak killer hornet. The, the real common names are a bit more more prosaic. They're things like the very long-lived hornet or the golden ringed hornet. Uh, in the United States, we've been calling it Asian giant hornet. I'm actually pushing to just switch to giant hornet uh, for a couple of reasons. One, the last couple of years, uh, the Asian moniker has been used, uh, frankly, in some racist ways as we've uh, undergone our, our campaign out here, and, and that's just not going to fly. Uh, and also, Asian's not super informative. All of the hornets are from Asia, so it's sort of like uh, having your blue whale's common name be the ocean whale, right? It just doesn't say anything to anybody about the animal at all. And then finally, um, there's another hornet species that's that's become invasive in Europe, where it is often called the Asian hornet because they had their own hornet there. And that has led to a lot of confusion in the literature. So we kind of go with the, the phrase just giant hornet. And that makes sense because it is truly giant. This is a Vespa mandarinia queen right here. Hopefully my cursor is working. Um, arrayed against a bunch of insects you would find in the Pacific Northwest, Hymenoptera you'd find in the Pacific Northwest, and Vespa crabro, the European hornet on the East Coast. And you can see that it's just enormous. Even the insects that are about as long come nowhere near the girth, uh, the, the mass of this animal. Um, of course, it is a Hymenoptera, like all the insects we just saw. That includes groups, you know, like bees and wasps and ants. More specifically, it's in the family Vespidae. So this is the group of social insects, or primarily social, many social insects. I'm just going to back up on that. This is the group of wasps. <laughs> includes about 5,000 species worldwide. Yellow jackets, again, true hornets, paper wasps, um, some other groups you might not have known about, and, and even one um, that is a specialist on pollen feeding. So some pretty pretty neat animals in this in this insect family. Um, the genus Vespa is what we're talking about when we were uh, discussing true hornets, and this is Vespa crabra right here, feeding on a pear, I think in an orchard in Pennsylvania. Um, there are 22 species of Vespa in the world. None of them are native to North America or South America. Uh, that said, we do have one in North America. The European hornet was established in Eastern North America for well over 100 years and, and is pretty common um, from the Eastern seaboard to about the plains. Uh, Vespa mandarinia, its native range is Asia. It's well documented in the Korean Peninsula, Japanese islands, and Taiwan. Uh, records get sparser as you get into the mainland, but um, that probably has a lot more to do with uh, with how records get reported than actual abundance. But it's it's definitely known from northern Russia through mainland China, and then it ranges all along the Himalayas. Uh, there are some spotty records from like areas down in in here in um, into China, but they're not very common. Um, and that is partially because it's really a tropical or a subtropical or a moderate temperate zone species. Um, it is not truly tropical. And as you get into the tropics, it gets replaced by another species, Vespa soror. That'll come up again uh, once or twice in this discussion. But Vespa soror, who essentially has the exact same behavior and is just as big. So really the other giant hornet. So maybe my giant hornet common name is not going to be very helpful either. Um, the colony cycle is not dissimilar from just about any other kind of overwintering social hymenopter. So I'm going to walk us through this. This might as well be the colony cycle for a yellow jacket um, or for the European European hornet or even a, a paper wasp. And, and it starts kind of right where we are right now, which is overwintering queens uh, hunkered down in, in a shelter place that they can find that seems, seems safe, I guess. Uh, that could be a pile of hay or a compost, uh, some, a, a, a little hole in the ground. 
you know, someplace that they can lie quiescent throughout the season. Um, not, you've probably found uh, yellow jackets in your wood pile. This is what those queens would look like uh, in the winter, just lying there, seemingly dead until you bring them inside. They'll be waking up soon. Um, March and April is typically when they start to emerge. Uh, it can last all the way through uh, through like June. Um, the queens will basically fly around. They'll look for some kind of carbohydrate sources to feed on. They're well documented at sap flows, uh, and in fact, there's this whole series of papers in Europe, in a, sorry, in China and or in Japan and Korea uh, about all the different hornet species showing up at sap flows and then trying to share the sap flows. The, the way they describe it, it's like animals feeding on a on a dead wildebeest in the in in the Sahara or the uh, in, in Africa, you know, like so the biggest hornets eat first, that's Vespa mandarinia, and then the smaller hornets will kind of work their way in as as mandarinia gets their filled. Anyway, they feed on carbohydrates. She will look for a place to initiate a nest. It's usually subterranean. I'll come back to that. And then for about a month, she will she will grow babies. She'll do the first excavation of the nest area, build the first layer of comb, maybe 40 cells, uh, and lay those first eggs. While they develop, it takes about a month, she is leaving the nest and foraging for insects to bring back and feed them. So this is a pretty sensitive time in the life cycle. I mean, every time that queen leaves a nest, she is exposed to getting hit by a tractor, or by a dog or trod upon by somebody walking around. So there's a lot of nest attrition during this time. Once those first workers emerge after about a month, they um, they do all that stuff. The queen just hangs around, lays eggs and lays eggs and lays eggs. And these workers will fly and forage uh, for insects to feed the larvae. They will collect the wood pulp to build the comb and expand the nest. Uh, and they will excavate the soil to make the nest get larger. Um, let's see. So that foraging that those insects that the hornets are doing is, is really pretty unremarkable through most of this time. They're just out catching an individual insect, bringing it back to the nest and feeding the larvae. Um, this characteristic that this hornet has in particular and that sister species has is late in the season. Uh, we're talking like well after August and usually September and October. They engage in these group predation attacks on other social hymenoptera. Honeybees are the one that we think about um, from an agricultural perspective, but they attack lots of other hornets and yellow jackets and paper wasps. Um, and that is a fairly a fairly uncommon behavior um, in, in in hornets and, and marks this and its other species as um, as, as special. Uh, that happens late in the fall or late in the summer, early in the fall, possibly for two reasons. One is maybe the other food sources dry up. You know, you're not finding beetles walking around anymore because they've sort of done their thing and, and their life cycle has already passed. Uh, social hymenoptera, in particular honeybees, stick around for a long time, and once you find them, there's a bunch there. It's also the time when the colony is ramping up the production of the next generation of uh, of reproductive. So this is when those virgin queens and males are emerging. Uh, they're pumping out as many as they possibly can. Big nests, up to 300 new queens. Um, so there's a really large protein demand during this time. Um, and and that sort of sums up most of the life cycle with the, the last step, of course, is for the, the queens to emerge and mate. This happens right at the nest, uh, right at the nest entrance. Basically, males hang around the nest, males from the nest or other nests uh, jump on an emerging queen. The majority of those queens shake the males off, something like 60 plus percent, and fly away and do not mate. Um, the other ones will mate. All of them will overwinter. Uh, the queens and the uh, fertilized queens will emerge in the spring and start the cycle over again. The unfertilized queens will emerge in the spring, eat some carbohydrates, and then die. Uh, and then once this sort of happens, by, by the time the new queens are, are emerging, the founding queen is dead and the colony sort of falls apart. The workers start biting each other and, and it all it all goes to pot. So that's the general life cycle of Vespa mandarinia. The really the two unique things about this are the group predation late in the season um, and, and how uh, late in the year the entire colony cycle takes. The nesting is, from what we know in the literature, almost always underground. Um, in, a, in a abandoned rodent burrow, a, a cavity formed by a rotting tree, which is what this hornet down here in the bottom is, is looking at. Uh, her nest was actually removed. She was a straggler and came back, found the neighborhood had changed. Occasionally, they're in hollow trees above the ground. The literature says that this should be within about a meter of, of the ground. They often go in and then climb up. Um, about 18% of the 2,000 or so nests that are recorded um, in the literature were in hollow trees. And then very, very rarely in human structures. So this is like in the wall of a house or something like that. So if you're out on a farm um, in a place in its native range and you have hornets in the wall of your house, it's probably not one of these species. I think there are like seven or eight documented cases um, 
in the literature. Could be a little bit more, but at least it's still rare. This is what a nest looks like. Um, this is a small comb that was pulled out of the, the nest that was found in British Columbia a few years ago. Uh, it was actually out of this nest right here. This was early in the life cycle, so early in the colony cycle, so the combs didn't get very large. Um, and also it's northern, so the, the nest might have been a bit smaller anyway. But the largest nest can be a couple of feet in diameter of these combs. I mean, can you imagine? I'm just holding my hands up two feet right now and thinking that is a comb full of wasps and it's big. And, and there'll be five to seven combs on average in those nests. So um, we're talking about a very large, very large colony, certainly not the largest in a uh, social hymenoptera, but maybe they make up for it by being giant hornets instead of small hornets. Um, as I said, the queens and workers, well, I didn't say the workers did, but queens and workers will feed on carbohydrates and liquid, liquid uh, food sources. Adult hornets actually can't ingest solid meat. Um, they have to drink fruit or, I mean, drink rotting fruit um, or sap, or they're fed by their larvae in a minute. Uh, instead, when they're foraging for insects, they're doing that to bring home to the larvae. That foraging happens pretty close to the house, nest most of the time, um, but under duress, they can go really far. Five miles at least has been documented in the literature. Um, but again, usually, usually close to the nest, right? Like if you can walk across the street to the guest, to the uh, grocery store, you're going to use a lot less gas than if you have to go across town. They basically capture any insect they can, um, anything that's big enough and slow enough, and they bring it back, they feed it to the larvae. And what happens is they'll capture a bug, they'll kind of bite off the parts that are no good, so get rid of the abdomen, uh, the legs, and the head, kind of mash up the thorax, and this is preferred because that's where lots and lots of flight muscles are, so this is a like, grade A steak, and um, they bring it back and feed it to the larvae. And these larvae down here in the bottom, you probably can't hear them. Yeah. Um, but what they're doing, if you watch, they expand their jaws and then sort of bash their head on the side of the nest. They're scraping the walls of the nest, and that is presumed to be a call for food. So a worker will fly back with her, her ball of mangled bugs. She'll hear this, walk over, and feed it to the larvae. The larvae then feed the, um, feed the adult workers in, in a process called trophallaxis by kind of puking up a clear fluid of amino acids and carbs, and that's what the workers uh, feed on. That reads them, and then they fly back out and, um, and look for food, often supplementing that meal with things they find in the environment. So I've tasted this hornet juice. It's, um, it doesn't taste like much of anything, but it is thought to be uh, really valuable. And, and in fact, some places, um, there, there's a, an artificial version of it that is used as an athletic supplement. So. All of that foraging that I talked about is, is this, right? Um, the hornets catch an individual bug, break it all up, bring it back to the babies, and the day is, well, the day's not done because then they go do it again. That that group attack late in the season has been very picturesque, picturesquely described as, as a slaughter phase by uh, the Japanese uh, biologists that, that sort of did the seminal work on this. And essentially what happens is uh, a worker will be going out doing her normal foraging behavior. She'll find a hive, uh, could be another wasp nest, whatever, and she will mark it with some kind of marking pheromone. And that recruits her sisters. Um, and essentially what happens is they come back and um, attack that hive. And this time, every single bee that they get, instead of breaking it, breaking it apart and turning it into a meatball, they actually just kill them, drop them to the ground, uh, and proceed. And they do that until the hive is no longer able to mount any kind of defense at all. Uh, you end up with an enormous pile of sudden dead bees, usually very char characteristically beheaded, although not exclusively. And um, that process can happen really quick. I mean, a, a handful of hornets can get rid of a beehive in a couple hours. In fact, the average time recorded in the literature is 105 minutes, right? So you could work your bees in the morning, go off, have some coffee and a sandwich, come back to a hive that no longer has bees, but instead have hornets in it uh, that will sting you. Um, and during this time, what, what they're doing once they've gotten rid of the, um, of the worker bees is they're essentially pulling larvae and pupae, which are like big tasty land shrimp, out uh, of the hive at will and returning them to their um, to their own nest. And they will do that essentially until everything starts putrefying. So they'll occupy the nest for several days, for several days. Uh, and this is a real pest problem for managed honeybees. Um, and um, we have sort of two main species of apis that we manage for honey, right? Apis serrana is the Eastern species, sometimes called the Japanese honeybee, sometimes the Eastern honeybee, sometimes Asian honeybee. Um, and that one co-evolved with Vespa mandarinia. So these bees have all kinds of cool defensive behaviors. You might've seen some of them. Uh, bee balls is the one that everybody gets excited about. And that's essentially when a, a scouting hornet that might mark the hive lands, you know, she'll sort of walk around on the landing board. The bees will back away, luring her in. 
Uh, and then once she comes in a little bit more inspecting, they will rush her as a group and several hundred workers will, will surround that hornet. They'll bite onto its legs so that they can't shake them loose. Um, and then they will essentially raise the temperature and flood it with carbon dioxide. Their temperature threshold is slightly higher than the hornets. So they kind of cook the hornet alive while starving it of oxygen. The one I really like the best is they also smell the marking pheromone they, or detect, I should say, this marking pheromone. Uh, and it's now well documented in, um, in Vietnam with Vespa soror, that other species that's very similar. And then also in Japan with Vespa mandarinia, that they, once the bees detect the pheromone, they will go and collect plant res resin or poop and then essentially smear that all over the, uh, the marking pheromone, trying to obscure its... Um, it's, uh, it's trying to obscure the smell. In contrast, Apis mellifera, the Western honeybee, the one that we use here, that's all across Europe, and is actually now really widely cultivated in, uh, in most of the world, including Asia, because it's just easy to work with and makes a lot of honey, does uh, essentially nothing. All right, that's not entirely true. They, they have similar, some, some of the similar kind of uh, behaviors. They'll, well, the one is they'll rush and attack the hornet, but they do not form this, um, this, this the bee ball with the same magnitude. They do not recognize the marking pheromones at all. Um, oh, I lost, uh, that's fine. There was a really nice elegant phrase that said their, their behaviors and, um, and response to the hornet is inelegant and unorganized. So they're kind of sitting ducks. Uh, and then, of course, the other reason people know about giant hornets is because they sting. Their venom is really pretty similar to any other Hymenoptera. It's going to be a painful sting, and the biggest worry is always going to be anaphylactic shock. If you're allergic to it, um, that's problematic. It's not even the most toxic um, venom pound per pound, right? The, the LD50 is, is, uh, is higher than honeybees, so technically honeybees even have more toxic venom if you want, but it doesn't matter because Vespa mandarinia is big, and so you get a lot of it. Um, silver lining is they're actually not that aggressive. They sting if you hold onto them. Uh, they sting if you mess around with their uh, nest, and they'll sting if they are occupying a hive or another hornet nest and you mess around with that. So basically, you have to go to them to get stung. I've been by them in the field now, both in Washington State and in Taiwan, and they could not have been less interested in me um, because I was smart enough not to go to the nest. That said, um, you know, most of the time, the things that people encounter are going to be individual, or you're just sort of unlucky. But if you are really unlucky, you can stumble into a nest um, or go try to get the nest on purpose without proper gear uh, and be attacked by, by a mass amount of hornets. That happens. It's really, really rare. Um, when it does happen, you can die from the amount of venom you take in. It can cause issues like kidney failure uh, and so on. But it just, it just doesn't happen that commonly. Most of the time, if you get stung, you're going to have just some localized tissue necrosis. This actually is a mess sting, so it looks worse. Um, these little lentil-sized cells can die in your arm, um, and and you'll be in a lot of pain, and that's it. Okay, let's see. Oh, whoa, one other thing. Yeah, again, because of that large size, this is a six millimeter long stinger. You bleed a lot more when you get stung just from the physical <laughs> impact of that sting. And so this is actually a guy in, in Canada, Conrad Berube, who, who helped remove the very first nest found in North America. And he was stung through a couple layers of clothing, uh, and that was the blood that seeped through. He was fine, no kidding, no kidney damage, no, uh, um, no kidney damage. He didn't die, and he just did have localized tissue necrosis. Okay, and that brings us, I think, to our first poll question. And I suppose somebody will take over now. Yes, Jeffrey is running the poll question. The poll and question just is up. Thank you, Jeffrey. A reminder to folks to please answer this if you are looking for pesticide and association credits, but we invite everyone to answer this poll question.
Okay, the poll question will close in 10 seconds. Okay, the poll question is closed and the uh, results are 95% saying false and 5% true. Chris? Great, um, we'll move on. Just uh, the, the, my, the the answer I wanted here was, was false. Um, most of the time the encounter ends in nothing worse than a sting and, and oftentimes not even that. So. Um, so allay your fears, everybody. Uh, you have to go out of your way to get serious injury or death. Okay, back to the back to the show. Okay, uh, um, so there's sort of your overview, your really quick snapshot of of what hornets do, right? And kind of maybe why we're con uh, concerned about them. Now I'm going to talk about them in our neck of the woods. Uh, sometimes we refer to it as Cascadia. That's sort of a bioregion that encompasses British Columbia, Washington State, parts of Montana, Idaho, and Oregon. Um, and it has this, here we go, this natty little little flag that represents it. So um, 2019 was when this really became on our radar. There were several hornet sightings in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, they began with Vespa soror, that similar giant hornet, the more tropical one, uh, being found in Vancouver, British Columbia in May. Um, basically, somebody found it near the port. It was just a, a bug that flew into their, um, their apartment. They caught it and didn't get stung. <laughs> and reached out to UBC, and that was it. They identified as Vespa Soror. Um, the salient characters, if you're interested, that are a little bit different are instead of having consistent stripes all the way down and then a red uh, tip of the abdomen, Vespa Soror is easily identified by its black abdomen. Uh, not a big deal. Stuff, stuff comes off ships all the time, um, but you know it was a reminder that that, uh, that regular old shipping is a, is a viable pathway for hornet introductions of some kind. Of course, it would have to be a queen hornet, right, to to establish a population and a worker hornet is not much to be that concerned about. All right, then in August, later that same year, we started seeing, oh, I still haven't even fixed it. We started seeing giant hornets on Vancouver Island in Nanaimo. Basically what happened, several people, several beekeepers and people reported these sightings. Uh, they were identified as giant hornets. Um, a couple of beekeepers and a provincial employee went out to wander in this park. They kind of looked at where the sightings were and said, okay, they're here, here, and here, and here in the circle. So we think they're probably in this park somewhere. It was a forest park right in the neighborhood. Um, they walked in one night to reconnoiter and immediately got stung. I, I laugh, but just like the chances are so, so funny, um, so, so low that, that it seems almost laughable. And came back later that night uh, with some carbon dioxide and flashlights and their best attempts at bee suits um, and removed the nest. Everybody, well, not everybody, but at least two of them were stung a few times. And if you're interested in learning about this, there is a, a, a video on YouTube of their entire process where they kind of go in there, um, gas, gas, the, uh, gas the, the nest with carbon dioxide, get the hornets as they're crawling out um, and throw them in alcohol. It's pretty diverting. Later, uh, that same year, several, no, like, what, 50 miles away in Blaine, Washington. So Vancouver, Van, Victoria is on Vancouver Island. This is off the mainland part of British Columbia. This is to the southeast of that. Uh, somebody in Blaine, Washington walked, walked out of their house and saw this lying on their porch. They thought they recognized it based on, I think, um, some shows they had seen on YouTube or, uh, or the Discovery Channel or something like that, reported to the Invasive Species Council who contacted us. And we went and picked it up and verified that that's in fact what it was. Um, right around the same time, there was a photograph in, in White Rock, British Columbia. So this is right across the border. So oh, I don't know, like 10, not even 10 miles from that. Um, and we also learned around that time of two suspicious hive kills. Uh, one of them you saw pictures of. These were both uh, hive deaths that very experienced beekeepers had. Um, people who, who make a living out of beekeeping, who have seen their hives eaten by shrews and yellow jackets. Um, and die from disease and it was like nothing nothing they'd ever seen before and one of them in fact was stung by giant wasps coming out of the hive and was so freaked out that they set the hive on fire so we started to think we had a problem and then that next spring we found three queens one in bellingham uh one near blaine and, and i actually i think the other one was in, in canada so this is what the landscape looked like at the beginning of may 2020 we had this nest up on vancouver island that was located and eradicated in 2019 we had these sightings, one of them a photograph, three actual specimens in 2019, two 
uh, hive kills. We learned about a later hive kill um, actually at the site of one of these specimens, and then these three queens in uh, in the spring. So we're basically, this now jump starts the early detection, survey, and eradication kind of response that we are supposed to do as departments of agriculture, and that is what we did. Um, a couple of side notes before we jump into that. We always get the question, how did they get here? We don't know for sure. We will never know for sure. Um, there were several potential pathways, but we know that international cargo remains the most likely pathway. And, and in fact, since we started this project, we've learned about um, dead hornets arriving in the mail, uh, not frequently, but you know, not never either. So then we know that Vespa velatina, a species that's invading Europe and South Korea, did arrive on, or, well, I say probably, but terracotta pots seems to be how it got there. Only took a couple of queens to establish those populations and they're becoming very problematic. Um, and in fact, not long after this project started, some people that import Japanese domestic cars, I don't know if you've seen these kind of cool four wheel drive vans that people like, they are now available for sale in the United States based on um, based on the age of the vehicles, which limit, like, uh, which limit what can be imported. Anyway, they're showing up in decent numbers in the Pacific Northwest. And some of those importers reached out to us and said, hey, not only do we find dead insects in these vans a lot, um, but sometimes they're even alive, such as this living nest of Polistes rothnii that was happily plugging the wheel well of a van that was imported into coma. You know, they killed this one, but the point is, is we have lots of viable pathways, even for an organism that kind of needs this one special uh, life stage to show up. What we do know um, is that the two introductions we had, British Columbia and Washington State, or Vancouver Island, Washington State, uh, were at least from two different animals. Um, so we looked at the mitochondrial genes, right? So these are the genes that are transmitted specifically through through the mother um, and found that they were different from one another. So that tells us that two, two individuals did in fact um, establish uh, nests. Uh, and then we, we also tried to look to see where they would come from. You know, understanding a pathway always requires a source as much as a transport mechanism. And our initial results suggest that the Canadian species was more like um, a sequence from Japan and the US species was more like a sequence from South Korea. This is a little bit sparse data when we, we literally just barcoded um, or, or sequenced one animal of each. So it doesn't get a very accurate read of, of the underlying population genetics. Uh, we're working on that now, though. We are now sequencing hundreds of animals from across the entire range. And so we should be able to add some clarity. But two, two introductions nonetheless. And we actually care not just because we know that they're pests and not just because we know that they will sting people and not just because when things get introduced, they tend to disrupt ecologies, but also because every indication is that we are good habitat. Uh, this is one of many habitat models that were constructed. So you basically look at where the animal lives, um, create a statistical model based on bioclimatic factors in this case, and then reproject that to somewhere else. The red areas, and the yellow areas are, are good habitat. You see the Pacific Northwest is, is fantastic habitat. And if it were ever to make it across the plains, there is just a ton of available re real estate in the east. Nothing about where these hornets landed that will keep them from establishing. So it now falls on us. Our main approach is to survey. So unlike, say, spongy moth, which uh, you may have known by a different name, that's Lymantria dispar, where we have a trap we can put out that will attract like every male for miles, uh, so really effective at low density. Um, no kind of attractants have been identified like that for, for hornets in general, let alone the species of hornets. So essentially we're using uh, these homemade bottle traps with a, an attractant slash killing solution in the bottle. This is some blend of juice and ethanol. And this is based on what people do in the native range uh, for local control, sometimes um, even uh, sort of area-wide trapping and eradication uh, programs. So, so basically we're hanging mimosas in trees and that is our primary um, survey technique. We have installed about a thousand of them in the area. We try to do one per square kilometer at least uh, in both 20 and 20, both 2020 and 2021. And we're also running some experiments. Um, so a rice wine and orange juice lure attracts lots of things, um, other yellow jackets, moths, fruit flies like you would not believe. Um, and even though it does get hornets, it's not necessarily the only thing, you know, it's, it's not necessarily out competing every other thing that might attract hornets on the landscape. So we are running experiments. In the United States, those are pretty unsuccessful. Um, and and what's, it's not clear if that's because the, the lures aren't any good or because there are no hornets uh, with which to 
um, test the lures, right? So if I ran a polar bear trap in your yard in, in Massachusetts, I might erroneously conclude that my polar bear trap is no good when really it turns out there are just no polar bears. So we'll pick this up overseas, but that is part of our program for the last two years. Um, and here's Dr. Dr. Jackie Serrano, USDA, who, uh, who develops these lures. She's a chemical ecologist and can do all kinds of amazing things to the bugs to come up with uh, potential attractants. Uh, um, and then finally, oh, and there's your bycatch. Look at all those fruit flies. It'll actually form like a cake of fruit flies that if you don't check the trap often enough, you, you'll come back and you'll find living insects walking around in it because uh, the juice is now um, like a spongy patio. Uh, and then we also employ live traps. So once we catch a trap, once we catch a hornet somewhere else, we will replace that with traps that still attract the hornet but don't kill it. Uh, it's a screen that, that prevents it from falling into that drowning solution. The goal there is to uh, tag it and track it back to its nest, which we will return to in a moment. Um, we also have been employing a community science and collaborating agencies trapping program. You know, we only had so much money and so much personnel, and we were basically concentrated in this area up here with the red, but there was a lot of public interest, um, a lot of agency interest, and so lots of other people willing to help us with the effort. So we just developed a full-blown program. People go online and log a site, maintain a trap. Um, they, they trap basically for the entire season we trap. They use the same kind of traps we use, a homemade bottle with a killing solution in it. We did ask people to not worry about Eastern Washington, um, both because there's no evidence that the hornets are there and the climate models say that this deserty area is gonna be crummy habitat. And we did encourage people to stay close to the area where they are, even if they can fly really far, they're not gonna make it from, from Blaine, Washington to Portland, Oregon in, in even a decade maybe. Um, and that was great. I mean, it like doubled the amount of traps basically on the landscape. And people got into it. These people, this person always named their traps Herbie the Love Hornet and Chitty Chitty Sting Sting. So a really uh, a lot of engagement on this program. And just to demonstrate how much how helpful that was, this is um, sort of a picture of our agency trapping. The um, I guess from that first year. Uh, again, looking at a trap one per kilometer. This is actually 2021. And then if we back out and add in the volunteer trapping, you can see it increases the density quite a bit, um, especially where people are in these areas and then gets us into places that we just don't have the personnel to trap. So it's it's super helpful. Um, and, and in fact, that's paid off. And, and that's indicative of, of something we always knew that the public would in fact always you know play a role in this. So the first specimens were all found by members of the public. They weren't Department of Agriculture employees wandering around. Um, and, and in fact, uh, we immediately started reaching out and trying to inform the public and developed a communications plan, like came up with all these um, protocols for how we would interact with people. Um, that included a, like maintaining some social media, um, social media presence, uh, making sure that this was highlighted on our regular invasive species uh, websites in Washington Department of Agriculture. We even got our own short list, which is great. I don't know if you work in government, but getting a, a short URL is often difficult. Um, the one from my lab, in fact, has like six more lines until you finally get to my lab. Uh, we had a listserv. We would email people that joined up on this listserv so they could know what we were doing as a program. We had a dedicated email and hotline and then this awesome Hornet Watch report form where people could go online, locate their uh, where they were and say, I think I saw a Hornet here and hopefully add a picture. They didn't always add a picture, but hopefully add a picture. Um, and so yeah, we we're feeling good about this. We had all these different ways for people to reach out. We were ready to go. And then this this was published in May and it pulled the rug uh, kind of literally out from under us. Um, the the interest was unprecedented and, and really was a challenge to deal with. And just to show you kind of how, how that played out. So this is our webpage, our, our short Hornet webpage that we're all excited about. You know, by the by 2nd of May, which is right about when that article came out, it had been looked at up to, I don't know, 5,000 times, which is really good for a Department of Agriculture website. By the end of that first week, we were approaching 80,000 views. Um, it was, it, it, we will never have anything that gets looked at that much again. Uh, this was uh, our public reports that, that we were getting on that, on that website I just showed you. So by, um, here we go. You know, up through 30 April, we'd had, I don't know, 80 accumulated reports that more than doubled over, or a, um, yeah, that doubled overnight. I guess it wasn't 80, it was probably like 30. More than doubled overnight. And, you know, it petered off, but it stayed strong. And every time a news article would come out, this would jump again. So lots of people using that website. It was great. 
Uh, and then in May, thankfully this died off again later, we had to deal with as an agency 150 requests for media contact. It was just, it was kind of fun for the first couple of days and then it was just really, really difficult to manage that workload while also running our survey and trapping program. Um, we got all kinds of cool uh, cool people responding to us with with ideas, you know, some of them um, some of some of them completely untenable, like we won't import Asian honeybees to North America because there are viruses and parasites that will come with it. Also, honeybees don't teach other honeybee species how to do things, so it didn't work. Um, a bunch of ideas that are good but unfeasible because of um, the economy or infrastructure in the area. It's super rural, so you know, internet connected traps don't don't actually work. Dogs could absolutely locate those nests, but they're expensive and take years to train. And also, imagine the uh, Imagine the fallout of, of a cute little trained beagle getting stung in the face repeatedly because it finally found a nest. Um, gluing tag, tags on, that's in fact what we ended up doing. Uh, training birds to eat hornets. I, I laughed at these, but actually just the other day I found a paper based out of India uh, for a different hornet species where they did in fact introduce hornets into the, into the chicken's diet and then would have chickens patrol these apiaries um, and the chickens would would attack and eat, eat hornets when they would show up. Wouldn't work on an eradication scale, but probably usable. And then some stuff that just didn't make any sense. Um, using a small robot covered in sticky substance and quick with seismic inducer to disturb hornets, which will rush up and become a robot. Um, I, don't, I don't even know what a seismic inducer is and we don't have any robots. So, but, you know, lots of ideas. You want to respond to all of these and it became impossible as a public official to do so because our email boxes would fill up and crash while these were coming in. And each one of these requires like a solid, you know, 30 minutes to really respond to, to explain why dogs can't work or um, why training crows won't work or that we don't have any robots. So it was a bummer. We had a lot of, let a lot of things go unanswered and it's something that I don't really like as a, as a bureaucrat. Um, but all that, all that said, our, our webpage thing did seem to be success, right? So we had almost 8,000 people, uh, sightings submitted. They were global, but mostly in North America, and about 4,000 of those just from Washington, British Columbia. We actually had to monitor, mo modify the website so it only showed you a map of Washington. That didn't keep people from submitting, but they did go down a little bit from out of state. Um, on this map, the orange sightings are things that we could look at and say, no, that's definitely not a giant hornet, right? That's a yellow jacket or a bumblebee or a shoe. Um, the purple sightings are things that we couldn't respond to. There was either no picture um, or not even a description, and we just had to call that undetermined. Uh, the yellow ones haven't been looked at yet. The 20 or so actual reports were all right up in here. They're obscured by the by the reports that weren't giant hornets, um, and it looks like you know that was really inefficient. But they did in fact lead to catching the first nests. Uh, just one quick side here. Even though the vast majority of what people submitted wasn't a giant hornet, they did pretty well. Um, they they mostly submitted things that look reasonably like a uh, giant hornet. They were definitely Hymenoptera. Uh, they were often orange and black, and they were often big. Most of them, or not most of them, but many of them were in fact a true hornet. These were all from the East Coast. Um, so I would say not bad. Uh, well, people like did a good job recognizing potential hornets. We also got some pretty pretty wacky stuff. I mean, like things like rotten beetle larvae, um, a little bumblebee from far, far away. We learned a lot about how to ma manipulate photos and and look at um, and, and and get a better do a better job of telling what's actually in it. Some some bugs. We will never know what this thing is. It's just a thing in a grate, a uh, big robber fly. An actual giant hornet, in fact, um, but reposted from somewhere else. So I think people would do that when they felt like they really saw it, but couldn't provide a picture. So we got adept at um, at using reverse image search to make sure that we weren't seeing something um, that has already been posted. Sometimes people would just give us our own picture right back in that same uh, that same way, and then sometimes people would um, would submit a picture that was clearly a giant hornet that was from the right area. Uh, that was not a picture picture repeat, and then never ever speak to us again. So we weren't quite sure where it was from. And you know, and I think this is the uh, we're from the government. We're here to help, kind of thing. Like I did my business. I showed you the hornet. Now don't even come close to to getting near me. So you know, those kinds of things were frustrating. But for all of those, we would end up with things kind of like this as well. Oh, sorry. Poll question number two. Forgot where I was. Okay, so I'll 
you have uh, 20 seconds to look at this image and then uh, we'll uh, have the poll questions launched. So look at the, the image and um, Okay, I think that's enough time. So you can you can now answer the poll question. So the poll question will close in 10 seconds. Okay, poll question closed. And the results are 94% saying false and 6% saying true. Race good to go. Okay, uh, it is in fact not a giant hornet, it's a bumblebee. Um, and we would get bumblebees submitted. Uh, this is a, the, the kind of things you would look for are one, this is yellow versus orange. They actually are quite smaller and most importantly, they're covered with dense hair, so. But bumblebee queen, all right. So uh, again, for all, of the, uh, for all of the inaccurate reports, we get some things like this. This is from somebody's doorbell cam. And this turned out to be very near where we found our first nest in 2019. We uh, were able to successfully catch some hornets in our live traps, affix these tiny -o, tiny, uh, tiny, -o, tiny radio tags to them. These are the kind of tags people use for things like uh, sparrows and hummingbirds and stuff. Um, we learned that the hornets would behave normally and that they would be able to fly with a little tag on. They would go and forage. They also spend an inordinate inordinate amount of time just sitting in the trees, um, mocking us perhaps. But at the end of the day, we walk through the woods and find the first hornet nest, which was about eight feet off the ground in a tree. Uh, one of the techniques we thought we would use early on, I didn't talk about this, was a, a an infrared camera. Hornets keep their nests at about 87, 89 degrees Fahrenheit, something like that. So generally much warmer than our background temperatures in Washington State, especially in the fall. But it turned out there was just too much light scatter um, for that to be used as a technique to locate nests. But once we had a suspect nest, we could do things like watch the hornets flying in and out. This is like at four in the morning or so. Um, and even more usefully, tell where in the nest, where in the tree that nest was. So they were flying in a hole up here. We were worried that they were flying in and they're going all the way down to the bottom. And we were in fact able to use these cameras to verify that the nest was, was up high. Um, we decided to extract the nests by vacuuming. Uh, we, we had thought about using pesticides and other things, but we always knew we would A, want to study the nest, and I didn't want my, my staff poking around in pesticide contaminated material. Uh, that also involves a lot more paperwork, and, and it turns out people vacuum up living, stinging insects all the time. So we donned these, uh, these really funny looking protective suits. Um, the suits are pretty horrible. You, uh, you can't see, see very well in them. You certainly can't move well. I mean, at that point, I was worried like we would hurt ourselves by falling off these platforms more than being stung by hornets. These are not all Department of Agriculture employees. It actually, we only have three or four people that do this. These are a film crew, so it doesn't take eight of us to remove a nest. Um, and we vacuumed the suckers up. So, So I would, you know, I resented these suits in a lot of ways, but then I would send this video this summer of some people in, that's probably Vespa Soror in the tropics digging the hornets up. And I told myself I would always wear this suit um, without complaining from now on. All right, poll question three. Question is up.
the full question closes in 10 seconds. All closed. The results are 82% saying the protective suits people will look like this stay puffed marshmallow man. 12% says say they like, it's like somebody bleached the minions. And 6% wait, I could have been wearing a protective suit myself. All right. And somebody bleached the minions is not my joke. That actually came from British television. Uh, <laughs> a, a really fun time looking at those pictures of us wandering around in the suits. All right. I'm noticing that it's getting uh, later than I thought. So I'm going to kind of move through some of these um, really quickly. We have now removed a total of four nests. The first one was in 2019 or 2020, and it was very late. Um, in fact, uh, it was so late that queens already were emerging. Uh, and there were many more in the nest. Um, based on the number of cat cells and the number of queens we counted, there might have been up to 200 queens at least produced by that nest. So, uh, and again, it was in a tree about eight feet up in the air. Um, there we go. The first nest we collected this year, we got in August. Uh, it was sort of what we would think as more normal for an insect nest. The insects were going in the bottom and the nest was in a hollow tree very close to the ground. Um, the number of combs and total cells seemed to match what we would expect for, uh, based on its, what we know about its native range. And yay, we got it early. The only queen in there was the foundress. And that is the case for the next nest as well, found about a month later, so early September. This one, again, was seven or eight feet up in a tree. Incredibly small, only four combs. And you can see the last comb was tiny. It had like five cells in it. And uh, one foundress queen. And look at this, males. We had about 30% of the animals in the nest were males. This is phenologically weird. That is super early. It doesn't make any sense until you consider that those males were probably diploid. Um, I didn't talk about the haplo diploid mating mate selection or um, uh, <laughs> sex selection chromosomes in um, in in a hymenoptera, but basically females have two pair of chromosomes and males have one. When they when workers become inbred, um, when they're homozygous at the sex allele site, you end up with these diploid males, and they just wander around and they don't do nothing, right? They don't they don't expand the nest, they don't forage, they don't build comb, they essentially retard the nest's growth. And that's what we saw. And that's a good thing from our perspective, right? We want more inbred nests that aren't good at developing. Uh, and then we had one more nest that was collected later. This one was like 18, no, 12 feet up in a tree. Uh, and again, back to sort of normal, uh, high number of combs. Uh, the cells are small, but it was very constrained by the geometry, the internal geometry of that nest. But again, no males one founder's queen. Uh, and when we did open the cap cells, we started finding males. So we got that in time, but if we waited a few weeks later, they probably would have been in the process of, um, of producing the next reproductives. So I said before, the 18% uh, of nests are recorded above ground in hollow trees. That is not what we are finding. Three of our four nests have been well above the ground. This was that only one that was in the ground. We don't really know what that means. We don't know if that's a fluke of inbreeding, if it's a faction, um, a factor of, of how sodden the ground is maybe up here when the queens are looking to build nests or if it's a, an, Im an imprinting effect like you know the queens wake up in a in a tree they emerge in a tw tree so so maybe think of trees or, or gravitate towards trees when trying to establish their own nests but it has been really interesting and, and complicated this in some ways we've been able to do some fun things with the bugs we caught um, such as measuring the size this is helpful because really the only way to tell the difference between a queen and a worker, at least externally, is to look at their size and weight. And so now we have a really good roadmap for how big queens can be versus workers and males. Um, we've been sharing these specimens with everybody. Lots of uh, the complete genome has been sequenced now. I already talked about the population genetic analysis. Um, Dr. Serrano and collaborators in Japan are doing a lot of work with pheromone analysis. Um, and some USDA people are looking for exotic viruses, specifically ones that might be passed to, uh, to bees. Specimens are now getting archived at, at universities. We have enough to share with um, with uh, outreach and extension and beekeepers and stuff like that. So it's been really rewarding that way. Um, one of the things we've been really interested in is what they eat. And we realized we could use a, a barcoding approach. Um, so this is that same mitochondrial DNA that, uh, that we were using to look at whether or not we had two different uh, populations established can also be used to identify species and that DNA gets passed through into the poop, the frass or the meconium that the larvae ex, uh, 
street when they're about to, uh, to turn into pupae. So we were able to harvest these from some cells um, and run them through you know, a DNA machine and find out what they ate. We also, while we were waiting around to figure out how to take this nest out of the tree, we were able to just capture workers returning with, um, with food pellets. And this is what those food pellets look like. They're all yellow jackets, but you can see how mangled up. You can't actually tell what species they are. Uh, anyway, we were able to sequence all that and we're still doing that with some of the new nests. And what we found is really similar. They eat lots of stuff, but they have a few main staples. Uh, the process we use is not perfectly quantitative, but based on how frequently different species appear in the samples, we can tell you that they eat bald-faced hornets, honeybees, and European paper wasps a lot. Uh, and then actually these, these other uh, yellow jackets were, were often represented as well. Almost everything else here was a one-off, including, including hamburger, which we still don't know if that was contamination or uh, feeding on a dead cow. There's a lot of dairy farms in the area, so that's possible. So if you remember back to May 2020, that's what the landscape looked like. We had one nest that had been found, uh, some specimens that were concerning, two dead bee kills, and, uh, and some sightings. At the end of this year, this is what that overall summary looked like. In 2020, in 2020 we had lots of detections. That's these yellow, um, these yellow dots. In 2021, we had only a few. And we're using the same density of traps, right? So, so the trapping effort hasn't changed. The number of hornets went way down. And we are hopeful that this is indicative of them uh, having a hard time establishing a population. We don't know that yet. We'll keep doing this for several years. Um, but it was more encouraging than it was discouraging. And then the red stars or gray stars, if you're a red green gold blind, my apologies, are where we found nests so far. The first one in 2020, and then these three last summer. We will basically do the same kind of stuff um, for the next, next season. We'll have another huge bottle trapping program. I think we're going to be able to actually have more, more bottle now that we really understand, um, have a better feel for how we're doing it. We will be going overseas to Korea and Japan to both run lure experiments and some foraging and migration experiments. One of the big things we don't know is how far queens fly at the end of the season. We still don't know how we're going to figure that out, but we have some ideas to, to try. Uh, we will keep our citizen science program rolling, and we're actually going to do an adopt a paper wasp nest program in, this year as well. Um, a lot of the wasps, the hornets that people saw were crawling around on paper wasps, which just hang out in the ease of your house. So it's pretty easy for people to walk outside, periodically check their wasp nest, and then tell us if they think they see a hornet. Um, and then people will get to get that to us by our, our all of our various reporting mechanisms. Uh, I don't want to belabor the many, 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 many people that were part of this, but I do want to emphasize that the landowners that have worked with us to get access to these nets, nests and remove them have just been out of the park helpful. Uh, and the thousands of Washington residents that have sent in suspect sightings or manned a trap have, have made this a, a more successful program than it probably otherwise would have been. Uh, so I will leave you with a gratuitous video of a queen on my dining room table crawling out of, of the nest. And that's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to entertain any questions. Well, thank you so very much, Chris. Um, I think I'll share some immediate feedback that we've gotten from the audience, just wanting to congratulate you on a fantastic presentation, very informative, uh, and I've quite enjoyed the, the videos myself. So uh, we have some questions coming in and we encourage folks to continue entering those in as I uh, Send Chris. Here we go. The first one from Sue. Can you just clarify? Um, I know you you showed a lot of great uh, images of the giant hornet, but what are the dimensions roughly in inches? Um, actually, I'm going to go back to the thing. The queens. Here we go. Um, oh, this shows width. The queens are are up to about two inches long, and then the workers can range from just about an inch to maybe an inch and a half. So, and there's actually quite a big size range in workers, which is why this was so confusing that uh, some of the first ones we were collecting were up here. And that makes sense because we were catching them late in the season. So they were the larger workers that had developed and, and, were, and were pretty robust. And, uh, and it was just, it was hard to understand what we're looking at. But basically between just about an inch and an inch and a half for workers are what you should see. And then queens are half again as large. Or a quarter again as large. Thank you. Um, a question uh, about managing, or and I think you've you've spoken of removing the the nests, but uh, Sue asks, 
if you found a nest in the ground and filled it in, would that kill them? Um, well, that's a good question. I mean, I think the answer is possibly, but we would be uncomfortable eating it at that. So if we find one of the nests in the ground, we're still going to try to vacuum them up and then dig it out and make sure we got every last thing. And then also it's help for us, helpful for us to do that so we can establish um, kind of how their phenology, how their, how their colonies progress in, in Northwest Washington, which looks like it's the same, but we wouldn't have known that in, until we dug them up. But yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, if you were to like fill it with foam, that would pretty much kill them off. The, the one caveat I will add is they will try to find another escape hole and use it if possible. The nest we vacuumed out of the base of the tree this year um, that tree was so rotten that a little bit collapsed on the backside and suddenly I had hornets swarming all over me, which had not been something I'd experienced yet. So, so you would have to be really thoughtful about where else they might get out. Thank you. Another opportunity to stress the PPE involved in this. Um, let's see here from Wesley. You've shown, you showed some images, I believe in the beginning, the three circular dots are arranged in a triangle located on the middle of the a giant hornet head. Are those more eyes or some other organ? That's exactly right. They are some kind of eyes. They're called a celli. Let's see if I can find a picture of it. Uh, there we go. They are a celli. Um, so these are the, the proper eyes, the compound eyes. And then these are what are called a celli. And those are used for, um, they don't really resolve images the way compound eyes do, but they will collect light um, and, and other environmental cues. And then that becomes part of the overall navigation system. Thank you. Um, oh, go ahead. That almost all insects have ocelli. So. Thank you very much. From Todd. Oh, this is a, a good one. Uh, we get, well, they're all good questions. We get a lot of reports about uh, giant hornets, murder hornets, which all turn out to be cicada killers. What would be the easiest way to distinguish the two species for the layperson besides size? Um, well, the... The patterns are pretty different, I, I, and the, the cicada killer I have is is not the eastern one. There we go. Um, there we go. It's really the, uh, the so size, yes, and then the the colors and the patterns. Oh, I actually I guess I don't have our cicada killer. Oh, here it is. Yeah, here's ours. So um, the the really distinct orange and black striping is part of it. The dark abdomen, but that doesn't work for the eastern cicada killer because they're they're pretty dark. Um, and then how how orange and big the head is. They also have clubbed antennae, which can be hard to see if you're uh, you know if you're running running into your house from it out in the yard. Um, and then uh, and then the nature of the of the spots on the abdomen, especially in the eastern one, tend to be like kind of these these shapely blobs rather than discrete stripes. There are lots of good resources you can um, find about this. USDA has has a page that talks about the lookalikes and specifically identifies features um, on it. And I'm I'm sorry I don't have that link. I should have thrown it in. But but there are resources out there that can give you a more defined answer and that you can refer back to rather than having to remember it from some dude in a talk um, available. And and not only USDA but lots of other departments of agriculture and universities by now have done the same thing. Thank you. Um, let's see a question here from Sean. What are the current goals of the USDA to eradicate or control uh, the giant hornet? Uh, we are still 100% committed to eradication. Um, we so there are some features about the animal's life cycle that seem to help us. One of them is they take so long to start reproducing that we have a lot of time in the season to look for them and find them. And that really seemed to work to our benefit this last year, right? We got all the nests well before any new reproductives could be produced. Um, I talked about that inbreeding that happens where you end up with this colony that is loaded down with unproductive, uh, unproductive individuals. Um, if you have a small gene pool, that's going to happen more often. And so that works in our favor. We think it's hard for them. I also mentioned that mating occurs right at the nest. And so when you, again, low population densities, finding a mate that isn't from your own nest should be more and more difficult. Um, and oh, oh, and then that low success in mating also works in our favor, right? So only about 37% of females seem to actually mate when they leave the nest. So that means of those 200 queens, we would expect only a fraction of those to be um, to be viable or to be able to start a new nest. So all of those things 
the low density plus our trapping program plus some of the research we're doing this summer um, we we are committed to eradication we think we can pull it off um, the 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 big we have the hardest part of this is detecting them early on the landscape which is why we have to use all of these different techniques we, I mean, the public is critical our trapping is critical um, and the, one of them alone probably wouldn't work so I don't know if that answered your question, but we're going to get rid of them. And, and oh. the USDA is supporting us 100%. I mean, this has been one of the best partnerships I've ever had with uh, the federal government, where everybody is so committed to the same process. Thank you. No, I think that's a fantastic answer. Um, let's see another question here from Jeffrey. Thinking about this from a different angle, are there any known benefits of the giant hornet coming to the US? Yeah. Um, I'm going to say no, but that's a very philosophical answer, right? Um, we're trying to eradicate it because we know it'll be a bee pest. It'll probably sting some people eventually, and that's no good, especially if you just throw your hands up as government and say, sorry, you're going to get stung with nothing we can do. Um, and then we don't really know what it might do to the environment. Um, it could be that it just becomes a naturalized uh, apex predator, much like Vespa crabro, the European hornet, has been on the East Coast and nothing much comes of it, or maybe we'd have another thing out there that, that controls insect populations that we wouldn't like, um, but that's a heck of a gamble. In its native range though, yeah, absolutely. It's it's both a pest and an important part of the environment that people people love and, and live in there, right? Um, there are some immediate uses. Uh, they are harvested for, for food and traditional medicine and novelties. Um, so there's that's part of economy and culture in some places. Um, they are part of the way again those ecosystems function, and to remove them might you know might might make those those uh, ecological communities less attractive. Um, but it but it's really it's it's a hard question to answer, and we get this a lot as a Department of Agriculture person about pests. Well, what good are they? I mean, I don't know. Maybe maybe the question is best stance saying. What harm are they? And then not worrying about it otherwise. But back to the main point, if they become established here, we'll take our chances, but but we generally try not to establish things out of their range because they cause changes quickly that we often aren't prepared for. Even the stuff that Joe was talking about before with the um, introducing the parasitoids, introducing uh, biological control, that's a, a carefully regulated and um, and very deliberate process to make sure we don't, we don't screw it up. So I don't know. That, that one's a hard hard to answer because it's very value laden and requires a lot of um, a lot of beliefs about what should be going on. Thank you, Chris. Uh, great response. Something I struggle with or think about a lot. Um, <laughs> let's see from Dan here. Uh, he says, "Fantastic presentation. Thanks. Were there any reports of apiary or honey beehive attacks this past year?" Nope, not a one. Um, the the only report we did have was on the Olympic Peninsula, which was alarming because it was very far away. And it turned out that it was probably just a regular yellow jacket attack. So, and, and the beekeepers on high alert, actually, we have a really strong collaboration with the local um, sort of hobbyist beekeeper association up there and, and they are, they have their eyes open. So no, we dodged it. Thank you. Uh, from Dolores, is there a possibility to deprive shipping containers of air or pumping in carbon dioxide to kill off hitchhiking invasive pests? Uh, you know, that, that's a question that's well outside of my, um, my knowledge. I think some of the issues with that are, are the infrastructure and technology that are available and how much it costs. So instead, what we tend to do is, is really focus on understanding high risk pathways and using using humans and dogs and things like that to, to look for invasive species. Um, um, we do fumigate and and heat treat things like um, like wood pallets and dunnage. So, so there are processes for that, but I don't know if that would work on a full container scale for every kind of good that gets shipped. Um, if a more direct pathway might be if uh, or a direct approach might be if in fact say vehicles were vehicles from the countryside or whatever were in fact a known pathway what we probably want to do is is work more closely with importers and just say hey clean it off much like we do with with spongy moth stuff and, and japanese beetle coming from the east coast and airplanes thank you and folks are thanking you for your great uh the great work done by you and your colleagues question here 
uh, from Dawn, do you know what the lowest temperature they can survive uh, as they overwinter is? Like, do they have a, a low temperature threshold? They probably do, but I'm but I don't know what that is. Nobody's ever done that research, and they do they do do just fine on in um in like northern in parts of northern Russia and Hokkaido where where temperatures do get cold. But now we don't know, and and um and I don't know if that would even be the critical factor. It might be more like the temperature during during their active lifestyle life stages that's more important. But no, don't know. Sorry. Thank you. No, um, the. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I, I, yeah, actually, I was just thinking like maybe we should just find out if we're gonna. We're we working with collaborators. They can just toss them in some freezers. I mean, obviously, it wouldn't be that that janky. But yeah, we can we could probably explore that. So I'm gonna write that down for for research. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. You could talk to Joe potentially too about freezing insects. He's done a lot of uh, hemlock woolly adelgid freezing. So perhaps yeah. there's something there. Um, uh, Cody has a question about, um, uh, is there an, a, a known reason they only establish nests in alder trees as opposed to others? Do they have any preference for trees or tree species? No, that is absolutely baffling. Um, first of all, we didn't expect them to be in trees. Um, even that 18% still sort of suggests that they shouldn't be in, in trees as often as we found them. Um, so, like I said, we, we don't know if that's because, if, if so just the tree part, if that's because that's the only place available, um, if we got lucky and, and we just found the one wasp that likes trees and so all of her daughters like trees, or again, this imprinting business, right, where the environment that the hornets emerge into often um, provides cues that they use to look for um, other things. So, so you can train, for instance, parasitoid wasps to respond to the presence of chocolate if you rear them on chocolate, if you put their, the eggs that they emerge out of on chocolate. So, so it could be all that stuff. In terms of alder specifically, it's probably just because our alders grow fast and have lots of cavities in them. Um, if you go out to the woods here, they are the trees that are the most likely to have places in the tree where a, an animal could set up a nest. So that's probably just a, a function of the nature of the tree. We are um, looking at extracting alder volatiles and experimenting with those. Um, just to see if there's something there but it's it's really pretty puzzling and and not there's just nothing in in what's known about their biology so far that gives us a clear answer on that thank you um let's see a question here from diane are other types of hive collapse visually similar to the ones caused by giant hornets uh the answer is yes in a, in a lot of ways which makes it tricky um to to know uh, if it, if your hive was was destroyed by hornets or something else, so some of the things that are different is um, there should really be just a complete a complete amount of, of dead bees around it, right? So so the the amount of dead bee happening is is really high. Um, if you were to con and and larvae should like be notably absent from the from the brood, right? You should um be able to open your hive and and uh, if no hornets coming out of you, come out of you, and then you look around and, and most of the larvae are gone, that is kind of indicative of hornets, but it also is indicative of yellow jackets. Um, probably the best the best way to tell is that during that occupation phase, um, there will be hornets in it that will come out and sting you a lot. Um, but it, it is really tricky, and, and we've been working with Washington State University's apiary lab to try and come up with kind of an etiology, a series of flow charts for that, and they have one, but it's it's not perfectly satisfactory because there are enough um, enough signs that are similar to other uh, other social hymenoptera attacks that just make it hard to have a sure answer. So it, it's really a blend of like where it occurred, are hornets even in the area, uh, are there hornets in your in your hive, and things like that. And, and I will say actually one of the um, two actually two of the of the sightings that we had from 2019 were in fact dead hornets that the bees were able to kill. So they're not as effective as um, as Apis serrana, but they're not totally defenseless. So one one apiarist who had like 80 hives found a dead hornet, and and, it, and he had seen seen hornets hawking there before and was confused by it. Found the dead hornet um, that his bees had killed, and then another guy who lost like three hives. This is the one up in in Blaine. Also found a few dead hornets in one of the hives. So you know that would be a a pretty good sign. 
Thank you. Uh, Sue would love to know more about the type of vacuum you were using for removal. Uh, so ours was just a shop vac. W what happened was I went out, there's a company here that, that goes out and collects yellow jackets uh, and they collect them alive because then they flash freeze them and sell them back to um, pharmaceuticals to make anti-venom. you know anti -venom. Uh, I went out with them and they essentially had a little handheld vac with a canister that the insects got sucked into. Um, then that worked fine. Granted, those were much smaller. So we just adapted that. We got a, a regular old five and a half horsepower shop vac. We got a huge cool canister, and I'm sorry I didn't put a picture in there. I thought there was one right after the uh, picture of all us, you know, loitering about in our suits. A big kind of clear pool canister. It's probably oh two feet, two feet wide and uh, eight inches in diameter or so, ten inches in diameter, and and we have that fitted in in the the hose, right? So we have a hose on one end that connects to the nest, and a hose on the other end that goes back to the um to the vacuum. We have a screen in it, and we suck all the hornets in, and then we cap it at the end and that's, that's it. Um, I was actually going to just throw them out on dry ice in the uh, vacuum initially. My boss was like, well, that'll just be full of, of smoke. We won't have the slightest light or, uh, or vapor. We won't know what's going on in there. And maybe we'll all get stung if they don't die. So that's when we came up with this other canister, which turned out to be great because then we had living hornets that we could share with our USDA counterparts to uh, do some of this semiochemical stuff. Funny story about that. The very first one we did in, um, in November of 2020, it looked like they had all died. So I'd taken them back to my hotel room. You know, I, I sent some off to, to Jackie to work on. We didn't know if they were alive. I took them back to my hotel room and dumped them out on my desk and I was kind of counting them. And I counted them a couple of times because I'm not so good at counting. I wanted to make sure I got it right. And I was entering data and they're all lying there like dead things. And I sort of saw one twitch out of the corner of my eye and I thought, oh, maybe they're not all dead. So I brushed them back in the canister, sealed it back up, set it down, kept working. About five minutes later, I looked out and every hornet was alive and they were just crawling in circles all around this canister. So, you know, I could have gone down to get a cup of coffee and come back to a, a room full of hornets if I really convinced myself they were all dead. Anyway, don't tell anybody that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's see a question here from Dawn. I know we're running short on time and I have to uh, do some closing announcements. So um, yeah. uh, let's see here. Dawn asks, as this is a cross-border issue with Canada, how have communications been to make sure this is a group effort between our two countries and it is successful? Um, we we work with the provincial beekeeper who's sort of in charge of this program in Canada all the time. Um, we were at the same meetings, we, um, we share information freely. As soon as one of us knows something useful, the other, the other jurisdiction knows as well. The response is a little bit different. Ours is well supported by the US federal government. The Canadian response is only happening at the um, provincial level. So, um, so the resources that they can bring to bear aren't the same, but fundamentally it's the same process. They're hanging traps. They have a lot of public outreach. Um, we've, we've shared our tracking equipment across the border um, when we thought uh, maybe one of the wasps had flown into Canada. It was obviously complicated by, by COVID protocols, but because we're in Washington state, we have kind of a couple of places where we can easily meet and mingle um, despite the border. So, so it's really good. It's, um, it's an, and you're, and you're right. It's an important collaboration. If we kill them all in Washington, the Hornets won't care if they're right across the border in BC, they'll just keep flying back. So it's, it's important to make sure that both countries are on the same page. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, this was a fantastic presentation, uh, excellent information, excellent questions following to provide more information. So we thank you so very much for your time and appreciate it very much. Cool, my pleasure. And if you have more questions or want to follow this, you can always find out about the program on the, you know, Washington State Department of Agriculture's Hornet page. You can even sign up uh, to get updates and things like that if, if it's interesting to you. So. Thanks, everybody.